uh, start in Portuguese and then I will speak in Portuguese. But again, I'd like to thank you because this is a very important moment. It's an EPP meeting and I know uh, inspired the fact of many of you coming to live in since I'm um, ma since I'm the mayor, I'd like to thank José Manuel Fernandes, the head of the PSD delegation in Brussels, um, Nun Mel, the uh, chair of CDS, the president of CDC, and thank all uh, our friends. Isabella Ayu was uh, from Madrid. Uh, and we signed an agreement with, and the two mayors of Athens and Warsaw too important examples of EPP showing our strength and how important cities are in Europe. You first a little bit about the story uh, of my election because I think is a story that is very interesting for the EPP, uh, very interesting for the future. And uh, as I told you yesterday, I think that I won this election for two reasons. The first, because I really acted as an EPP member, uh, listening to people, working with people, and really making politics in a different way. And that is extremely important uh, in these days where people don't believe anymore in politics and they don't believe anymore in politicians. So there's an opportunity for us as a party to make that difference, to make that difference and make the difference to be the ones that make politics in a different way. And so making politics in a different way is really listening to people and then get people to be with us. And so in the town hall of Lisbon, we created something very different, which we call the citizens assembly. And the citizens assembly is to get the citizens to come and work with us. Instead of doing the pure public consultation, one of my first promises was really to get people to come and work with us. So we do these meetings where we get people randomly from the city, they come and they work on solutions. They work on solutions that then they work with the people of the municipality to make it happen. And that changes everything. And I think that's one of the reasons that really we won the elections. It was that one of the main reasons, to make it different for people. The second reason I think that people today understand uh, that to be a mayor, you have to be a person that links the cities to Europe. And so the mayors of the past, or the, I would say the typical mayors today, they should adapt to something that before they would do a link in between the local town hall and the country, and today they need to do it with Europe. And I think that people understood that better than politicians and better than prime ministers and better than countries. And so I think that link between the cities in Europe, it's the link that I wanted today to talk about because of the Next Generation Europe program. I think that cities today are really the translators of European policies to citizens. And when I say that cities are the translators, it's because cities are the only platform that can translate your language into the language of the people. And when in Europe, you as parliamentarians decide that you want to have carbon neutral cities, that for people locally doesn't mean anything because they don't even understand what you're talking about. They need the translation of that carbon neutral cities concept into very simple concepts and concrete actions at the city level. And that's what mayors do, is to basically do that translation. So when I became a mayor, the translation of that, that with the socialists was just about keeping the same discussions for me it was really to change it to very concrete actions. So the first action was to make public transportation free for the young and the elderly. 
And by making public transportation free for the young and the elderly, we were able to go and explain to people what does it mean to have less carbon in our skies, is to have public transportation for free. And today, 70,000 people have public transportation for free in Lisbon. Then, I translated that in the fact that if you want to stop having floods in Lisbon, you have also to have concrete measures to adapt Lisbon to the climate change. And we started the major works that Lisbon has never seen before, which are two tunnels that will get the water from the top of the, the hills to the river so you don't get floods in the city. This is adaptation. And we have to adapt cities in a way that people say, yes, if I have these tunnels, if I have these collectors, then I don't have floods anymore in my town. And then you talk to people and they say, oh, okay, now I understand climate change. Now I understand what climate change is about. Climate change is about doing these things that actually make that my life is easier. And that's a big difference with the socialists, is that the way we tackle climate change is about making people's lives easier and not the other way around. And so when we go on this narrative that is not a narrative, is the fact of explaining very easily to people what these discussions are about. We can talk also in Europe about a health union, but if we talk about a health union, what does it mean for the people on the ground? We translate that in Lisbon in different actions, in having a free health plan for the Lisbon people, so people in Lisbon can have access to a doctor. And today we have 7,000 people in Lisbon that can have access to a doctor, which before was not possible, because they were waiting for months and months to have access to a public doctor. And so, translating these actions, I think that's what the EPP can do, and that's what mayors can do, and then people understand what you do. You know, we have, uh, and I was the Commissioner for Innovation and Science, I spent five years dealing with universities, with startups. But in my job, I was rarely talking to mayors. I confess myself, as a commissioner for innovation, I rarely talk to mayors. I talked to Ricardo Rio, that is there, the great mayor of Braga. And uh, Ricardo, we had these conversations because he is also a mayor in Portugal that makes this link to Europe in a different way. But I think it's also your effort as European parliamentarians, as uh, people that work for the good of Europe to do these translations. And doing these translations in actions is very difficult because you have to put dates, you have to be able to do concrete things, and you have to do it in a way that people feel it. So when I tried to translate the idea of innovation to Lisbon, uh, I came on to the ground saying, I'm going to create this unicorn factory. And people called me crazy. How on hell is going to create this unicorn factory? What is a unicorn factory? And I said, I'm going to transform Lisbon in a capital of innovation to get people from other places to come to Lisbon. I want the big companies of the future to come to Lisbon, not the big companies of today, because the big companies of today, they are big, so they are where they are. But I know that the big companies of the future, if I settle them in Lisbon, then I will have a different economy. So we started that, people made fun of it, and then suddenly, one year later, we got 11 unicorn companies that have settled their business in Lisbon. Two from the US, one from Israel, from India. I was just yesterday, yesterday sitting with another unicorn that has created more than 50 jobs as they started 50 jobs in Lisbon. Others have created 100, 150 jobs, all in Lisbon and in one year. You know how many unicorns you have in Portugal all together? Seven. We attracted to Lisbon 11 in one year. And so those actions are the actions that really can make a difference. But 
if you want to make that difference, you need the help of Europe. And I think that the Next Generation Europe program was probably the best invention that you've had in the European Parliament, in the European Com Commission, and with the Council. And the European Next Generation uh, program can really help us on this translation. That's, for me, the tool that should be the tool that would help us. But unfortunately, what happened in a country like Portugal is that only 10% of that next generation Europe came to the cities. Only 10%. And the way that the government designed this program was not to help the private sector. Of course, we need help in the, in the public sector. But the balance was totally unbalanced. So we designed a program that should have been focused on cities, because the cities are these platforms of change. But no. What the government did was basically to do a platform to basically allocate that money to only the public sector, or I think the big majority of the money is going to the public sector and not to the right places. So let me tell you as a friend uh, and as one of yours what I think are the big difficulties today uh, for us as mayors. And I'm sure that Ricardo will uh, then tag along uh, with my comments. First, uh, I know that the EPP fought a lot for this Next Generation Europe package to be longer, to go to 2027. That didn't happen. So we have an impossible deadline. So that impossible deadline has an effect on choices that is absolutely ridiculous. You have 2026, so you know that you have to do everything before 2026. So what do you do? Do you do new projects or you try to grab the projects that already exist to put the money? And if you want new projects, you really have, you really have to change the deadline. So my ask to you is that we can change this deadline at least to 2028. And I know that you've asked for 2027 as a party, but today it's impossible. It's impossible to do all these projects. We have big projects in Lisbon. One specifically, which will be the unicorn factory of the sea, the oceans, that I cannot get done if you don't change the deadline. So that's my first ask to you. The second point is that, and I don't know if it's the Portuguese government or the European uh, decision, is about incentives. If the incentives for next generation Europe are that for every month of delay that I have in a project. I have to pay over a million euros of fees to the government. I mean, that's wrong. If by any chance I cannot finalize my project by the deadline, I have to get all the money back that you've sent me, it doesn't work. If I am as I am still waiting for more than a year forget reimbursements, it doesn't work. And so we have to be very careful because if the incentives are negative, then people will not go along. And so I have a big team in my town hall just dealing with the next generation Europe, but they feel afraid. And when you have these European programs, and then people feel afraid of not being able to do it, what do you think that a public servant does? And rightly so. He just says, okay, I'm not gonna go ahead. So we have really to review the way that we have designed these incentives. And finally, the third point that I wanted to get across today to you about next generation Europe is uh, the one that I think is central to everything. Being a, uh, a European like I am, always defending Europe, I think 
Europe should not be a European project that we go on just checking lists to have all the checklists right to have the project. What do I mean by that? I think that one should look at the purpose of projects, not only if the project checks the list of environment, if checks the list of digital, if checks the list of everything that we know that is what Europeans want. And I am that European. I want my projects to be sustainable. I want my projects to be digital. But I want my projects to have a purpose. And my projects to get us to have results. And today, sometimes we feel, and I feel in my teams, that when I'm applying to these projects, I'm not making my people think what's the purpose of the project. But they're saying, oh, does it check the list what they want? Oh, they want us to say this. They want us to say that. They want us to uh, apply and have this wording. No, but that's not the point. The point is that is this project will be transformational? Is this project transform be a pro project that will transform the, the, the Portuguese economy? That's the point, you know. And, and I think that somehow in the middle of all the red tape and bureaucracy, we lost track of that. So take this advice as a advice of a friend, but more than anything, I want to thank Europe. And uh, I want to thank Europe from the bottom of my heart. And I'm going to do it in Portuguese now to end my speech because I think is extremely important uh, for uh, the Portuguese media and for uh, my Portuguese friends. Nós sem Europa não somos nada. Without Europe, we are nothing. What we live, what we've been experienced, what we experienced during the pandemic leads us to conclude that we need to thank Europe every single day. And I thank Europe for being able to construct what will be the two largest uh, tunnels in Lisbon, in Europe, to prevent flooding in Lisbon. We're doing it with Europe's money. We are working with Europe every single day. And if it wasn't Europe, we wouldn't be able to. If it wasn't Europe, and what was the greatest vaccine uh, center in Lisbon to vaccinate people during the pandemic wouldn't have existed. It wouldn't have happened. And that's why we need to thank Europe, thank Europe. And today, to be convinced of Europe's role in our lives. As mayor of Lisbon, I want to be the one taking care of people, but that establishes that essential link tie uh, between um, our cities in Europe. Our cities will be stronger. Europe will be st stronger. Long live Europe. Long live Lisbon. And thank you very much. Bom dia. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I, uh, first of all, I'd like to greet the mayor of Lisbon and uh, also like to welcome all our uh, local authorities, the uh, Euro members, and also greet Siegfried and Morrison. Siegfried Morrison that negotiated this mechanism leading to our recovery and resilience plan. And also, again, I would like to welcome all of those taking part in this uh, initiative. The Popular Party has been a solution, has been in the genesis and also in the negotiation that is both of the funds and also of this historic program. I don't know if it's the only one in our history, but this is a historic program, unprecedented one. And it's for the first time that the European Union 
goes to the market, finances itself. So afterwards, to give million, thousand millions of money to the member states so that they can invest in their economies. And I, it, this has to go well. If we want to repeat, and this has to go well, and I hope it doesn't repeat that this would be the sign that our economies would have a type of pandemic, but also it, it brings an additional obligation. That is, there are many people that are aware of the fact that the debts of these plans, recovery resilience, will be paid, the debt will be paid by 2058 by the EU's budget. And this will cost around 15 billion euros a year. And this compels us to seek new revenue that does not penalize the European citizens, but also prevents cuts in the future. And that's why the good execution of this plan is an obligation and not to penalize our future generations. And I said that the date, the date of this step, that is, will be paid until 20, by 2058. This is a historical opportunity and that we cannot uh, undermine. And its objective is to strengthen our economy, to give more resilience, to give it more resilient, and also to modernize the member states. And then the question, where are the structural measures to really modernize Portugal? Where is the transformation that should accompany investments? And then there is here a question that can be asked. And it's not enough that is in terms of uh, we have to define our national um, design. Where do we where do we want to stand in 2030? Vocational training, education, exports. In terms of our competence, education, research, uh, fighting poverty, and then all can contribute to that objective with our actions and our programs. And it's unacceptable, as I've mentioned earlier, to lose sight of this opportunity. And there is here something that saddens me. That is, some governments, and especially the Portuguese government, also doesn't um, doesn't have that vision. It does what it seeks. Uh, its political survival uses these funds to uh, uh, to fund uh, its ideology and its state. It's unacceptable, and not using these resources to create. Uh, capitalization instruments for the company so that they can face the high inch face out high interest rates or not supporting enough the families there's a storm of millions that is it's not only this plan which is um, growing 1.63 million years of what had been initially foreseen because we did not respond to the event as we should. And with Siegfried Morrison's negotiation, we have more than 700 million repower you for the energy, which was very important to know where these 1.6 million additional euros will go to. How will they be invested? These 700 million additional 700 millions. I'm looking at two social partners that is Zeep and the um, Mercies, the IPSS and the Mercies. And I'm um, looking at two social partners that will be intervening later on. I'm speaking about SIP and the Union of Portuguese Mercies. They know the needs uh, that exist. And as what has been referred, instead of being just users, we should be programmers of funds. And it would be time to be fund programmers so as not to lose uh, these opportunities. And it's not difficult to use these resources um, for competitiveness, for territorial cohesion, um, for a salary increase. All of this is possible. We have the money. And it's unacceptable not to have a minimum of ambition with these enormous resources that the European Union has made available. And that's why 
I demand a competent government, a government that acts with transparency and that strengthens our country in these in different areas. We are, every year we speak about fires, forest fires. Where are there resources for the forest policy? Every year we're going to have to, we're going to have problems with water supply. Where are there projects to solve its efficiency interconnection of these system? And I'm going to conclude by saying the following. Com it's competitiveness, sustainability, but it's also it has to be territorial cohesion. And this hasn't been included. It, there cannot be um, just a single thought that uh, there's basic sanitation base that it, uh, in uh, all of Portugal. There is in this great opportunity has to put us in, in at another level. We need a, a government that could be able to articulate itself so as to articulate the funds. So we have a minister, for instance, a minister and um, the cohesion policy we have planned when we have a minister of cohesion that only manages re the regional programs and a minister of the economy that generates the C program with 380 million euros and everything has been everything then uh, is said about the lack of organization that exists within the government our objective is to help all member states to do what we can for Portugal to use well these resources and also this seminar and this uh, initiative. I truly welcome and thank you, Siegfried Morrison. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for this event this morning. On behalf of the EPP Group in the European Parliament, we are very delighted to be in Lisbon today, to be here amongst friends, to be here hosted by the two member parties of the EPP from Portugal, to be here hosted by José Manuel Fernández, the head of the uh, Portuguese delegation in the EPP Group, by Nuno Melo, uh, co-president of the Portuguese delegation in the European Parliament, and of course the president of CDSPP, Paulo Rangel, vice president of the EPP Group, I see with us also uh, Alvaro Amaro, uh, Maria Garza Carvalho, Lidia Pereira, um, colleagues who represent Portugal in the EPP group, in the European Parliament, and who work every week to make sure that the voice of Portugal is heard, to make sure that in all decisions which we make in the European Parliament, on the budget, on agriculture, on fisheries, on industry, the decisions are good for Portugal and they take into account the needs of Portugal. I would like to say a special word of appreciation to Carlos Moedas. We came to Lisbon to show our support, our appreciation for him and to learn from him. Because five years we had the chance in Europe to work together with him in his function as Commissioner for research, science, science and innovation. And we saw how he helped modernize the whole European Union to make it more innovative, to make it more science-based. And now we see how he is doing this concretely in Lisbon as mayor of Lisbon. And I can say the people of Lisbon are lucky to have Carlos Moedas as mayor in this time. <laughs> I would like also to thank mayors and colleagues who came from all Europe to be with us here today. Marco, Ma Marco Marcola, the president of the Helsinki region. Isabel Diaz Ayuso, the president of the Madrid community. Rafael Traskowski, the mayor of Warsaw. Kostas Bakoyanis, the mayor of Athens. They are all here because as EPP, we want to build a network of mayors who are close to the people, but who also work together at European level. They learn from each other, they see the best projects, they bring them back home, they support each other. This is what the EPP stands for. The topic of our meeting today is European funds. And the truth is that there are now more European funds available than at any time before, and European funds 
money from the traditional budget of the European Union and from next generation EU are a major source of investment in Portugal, in Spain, in many member states of the European Union. Next Generation EU is the biggest package of economic support ever created by the European Union. It is unique, it is limited in time, so this is why it is so essential that we spend this money well. Socialists only talk about spending money, but for us, for the EPP, it is about spending it well. It is about doing what helps people most. It is about putting the money in those projects which generate more growth, which generate more jobs, which allow for stable and well-paid jobs for, for the people back home. And um, this is also what we want to discuss about today. We believe that in order to finance the right projects, the voice of mayors, the voice of regions has to be heard, and we know that this was not heard enough by the Portuguese government here, and we want to give mayors a voice because there is a lot of money, time is short, next generation EU, the implementation of EU funds can be a success with the mayors because they know what is needed at local level. They know what are the needs of the people, what infrastructure project communities need, uh, which schools need support, which hospitals need to be modernized. Um, this is why implementing European funds with the mayor is a guarantee that money is used where people need it. Um, and this is what the EPP stands for. This is what we feel lacked when the, was missing when the Portuguese government prepared the plan. And this is why our message to the government of Portugal is <laughs> involve the mayors in the implementation of the plan. There was not enough involvement in the preparation of the plan, but this can, it's still not too late, this can be recovered now, involve mayors. And we see in neighboring country Spain that this should also happen. We also know from mayors in Spain that the socialist government in Madrid is also not hearing them, not listening to the projects, and this is why we say to the government in Madrid, like we say to the government in Lisbon, work for the people, take their projects into account. European funds are money from the people of Europe for the people of Europe. They are not money for governments to be, to be administered in a central way, but they are money to be used where they are needed. And we know from other EPP-governed countries that the involvement of mayors can function. We saw it in Greece, where local leaders were heard by the government. I saw it in my country, Romania, where the government decided together with the mayors which hospitals to modernize, which hospitals to enlarge, and uh, it enlarges those hospitals which mayors said that they are the most, the most uh, urgent. Um, time is short, we can only succeed with the, with the mayors. Of course, the more money there is, the more we are obliged to be transparent. This is wha why what Carlos Moedas as mayor said, we govern with the people, they are involved in decisions, they have a right to know where taxpayers' money flow should also apply to, uh, to European funds. This will also be a topic for our discussion today. How do we make sure that we use money in a transparent way, that we use it to modernize our, our, our economy, our public systems, to make them more, more resilient? This will be the topic of uh, our event today. Make sure that we spend it well, that we spend it with local communities, that we put money where it matters. We know it can be done. We know from Greece, we know from Croatia, we know from Romania it can be done. We hope um, it will happen also in a way in which uh, authorities here will work closer to the mayors, closer to the citizens to do it. We as EPP are ready to do this, and thank you very much for joining us for this event today. Now, before I go, let me just invite up here to the panel, the, the first panel, because we will have two panels today. The title of the first panel will be exactly this, Involvement of Local Authorities in the Design and Implementation of the Recovery Plan, Lessons Learned. 
And let me invite on stage the moderator for this panel, Jan Olbricht, a vice chair of the EPP group in the European Parliament from Poland. Is <laughs> Isabel Benhumea, member of the European Parliament from Spain and vice president of the Committee on Regional Development in the European Parliament. <laughs> Rafał Trzaskowski, the mayor of Poland. The, ma the mayor of Warsaw, and Poland would be much better off today if Rafał Trzaskowski would be the mayor of Poland or number one in Poland. Antonio Saraiva, the president of the Confederation of Portuguese Business. Ricardo Rio, the mayor of Braga. Uh, Manuel Lemus, the president of the Union of Portuguese Mercies. And Dwight Novo, the mayor of Oliveira do Bairro. And I leave you with Jan Olbricht, who takes the lead now. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, Siegfried made a mistake. I'm from Poland. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, there was very, very close that Rafał Czarkowski be the president of our country. So, it's never lost, you know. So, let's, let's, let's hope in the future because it was, he was a really very good candidate. Uh, I would like to... Um, because all the uh, p participants of the panel have been obviously Jews, I don't have to introduce the panelists from Portugal. This panel is co quite uh, spe specially uh, constructed. Why? Because we are coming here as the uh, uh, mayor of uh, Warsaw and uh, members of the European Parliament. And of course, the, uh, I just want to inform you in, uh, non-officially that of course we in the Parliament uh, we are following the, all the RRFs in member states. So it's not that we are coming here not knowing, I mean, not knowing nothing about the uh, Portuguese RRF. We have a special center which is preparing the analysis of each RRF. So we have the, uh, in fact, we are, we, uh, we are now informed what is the state of play. But this, uh, this is not that we will uh, try to discuss, I mean, we outside, from outside of Portugal to, to discuss your plan in details, like coming here and to control and to monitor. But let's start to think uh, from different perspectives. First perspective is, okay, what uh, the, uh, 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 our two speakers, which will make the introduction, or how they look at the uh, situation which is... Uh, which should be a, 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 a model situation. I mean, it's, it means how it should look like. I mean, the, all the consultation of, of different stakeholders, mainly the local governments. What is the situation that we would like to have as a very, very demanding and very clear um, politically? So that's why the first two speakers, they will tell us from, the, from their perspective, from their practice, as the, um, uh, how this process of consultation should look like. And of course, not only consultation before, but also the participation of different stakeholders during the implementation. During the implementation. I mean, the question is, uh, is how it should be controlled? Is it really controlled? What do we expect? Uh, 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 first uh, uh, speaker uh, will be Isabel Benhumea, which will speak about on behalf of the uh, we work on inside the parliament. She is the member of the regional development committee. So just looking, okay, what are our expectations concerning the RRF, especially that we have, in fact, two different policies. One is RRF, the other one is cohesion policy. RRF has completely different rules. Cohesion policy has different rules. So RRF is limited in time. Cohesion policy is much, much longer. The question is how we in the parliament, how regional development committee and the member from Spain is looking at this problem of our, how it should look like. At the beginning, this is the history, not in Poland. In Poland we, have, we are still ahead of, 
of I implementing, but uh, how you would, we as in the parliament, we, will, we would like to see it. Just to, just to finalize this introduction, you know, we, we practitioners, because you know, I mean, many of us, we used to be the mayors of the cities. Me also, I was the mayor of the city. I know what it really means, consultation. And consultation very often can be, it's everything is ready, and we will send it to someone and say, please, you have two hours to respond. If you don't respond, it's cons uh, anyway, it's consulted. Everything is ready. This is not consultation. This is not a consultation. This is just sending something which is ready. We would like to hear the, what, uh, what Mayor uh, Moeda said, work together, work together. So first, Isabel and Humea from Spain, from the Regional Development Committee. What is the expectation from your point of view, from the Parliament, from the Regional Development Committee concerning Aurora? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Moedas, for this really good and warm welcome to your beautiful city. It's a pleasure to be in, in Lisbon, in Portugal. And thank you very much, uh, Siegfried and Jose Manuel, for organizing this very, very important event, which I hope that will continue around Europe to give voice to what I believe that they are the most important s stakeholders in the success of the implementation of the recovery fund which which are the regions and the local and the local municipalities and I start by saying my, and of course I want to say hello and to all my good friends from the Portuguese uh, delegation of the EPP that we work together so hard in agriculture in taxation in many other fields and it's great to be with with you here today I wanted to share with you three ideas first of all is the, it, has, it has been uh, said previously, and I wanted to dive in a little bit on that, which is the huge opportunity we have ahead of us. We have uh, a project that gives the European countries a unique opportunity of huge investment, investment, public investment that comes from the European debt, as Jose Manuel said, uh, is the first time that Europe goes into the markets to fund such uh, such an, uh, a program, and this program is only one opportunity. And as we are among friends of, of the same family, which is EPP, this, the success of this program is the success of EPP, because it was led and it was uh, designed by EPP Commission, and with the, we are the largest group of the European Parliament. So we really need to make this opportunity a success. And if we don't do that, if, we, if there is not a success, if the money is not well spent, if the money is not put into the right projects, if the right reforms are not put into place, then at the end of the day, EPP will be somehow pointed out are responsible for the failure of the RRF. And I really believe that we really need to acknowledge this. Secondly, there is a, a, a um, um, situation among most of the member states, and we've been denouncing this within the Regional Development Committee in the European Parliament, also within the Economic Affairs Committee in the European Parliament, that the member states pushed to have absolute control over the recovery fund. They didn't allow to put in the regulation that it was mandatory to take into account the proposals of the local municipalities or the proposals of the regions. They decided to have full control, centralized control in a regional Europe, in a Europe that is based on the regions. I, I can use this, the example of Spain, and especially we have here Isabel Diaz Ayuso, president of the region of Spain, where thanks to the independence that the mm, region of Madrid have, the citizens in Madrid have much more opportunities and right now living in Madrid gives you much more opportunities to find a job, to start a company. So how come when you design a program that it has happened in Spain, you do not count, you don't take into account the proposals that the mayors, that the presidents of the regions put into place. And what is more important, nobody is really paying attention to the denounces that the Commission is receiving from the regions. The Committee of the Regions has had very, very tough reports, very tough reports saying the regions are not being heard, and the Commission is not reacting to this. And I really would like to raise my voice to say to the Commission, you really need to put pressure on the member states to take into account 
to take into account what the regions and the municipalities have to say. And the third point that really struggles me and, 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 and worries me a lot, this is public money. This is money that comes from the taxpayers, the European taxpayers. It's money that we will have to pay back in, 20, in 2053. It's money that right now we don't have clear data on how well is spent uh, how, how is it being spent? Right now, we don't have European data on the implementation of the recovery fund. There is no full transparency on how the money is being spent. And this is something we cannot accept. Right now, the responsibility on the implementation of the spending of the money relies in each of the member states. Some are being transparent, which is good, but others are not. Is the case of Spain. Right now, we do not know where the money is. We do not know if the money is being spent or not. We don't know which projects right now are being funded with this money. And we cannot allow this to happen within the European Union with the taxpayers' money. Another concern, right now, most, most of the projects that are being funded are public projects. Have nothing against good public projects. But if we really want to create growth, if we will really want to create jobs, if we really want to invest in the design of a resilient and a competitive economy, we really need to make sure that this money goes into the private sector, goes into the startups, the entrepreneurs, the SMEs, and also the large corporations. And a final remark, we've said this EPP constantly with Siegfried, with Jose Manuel, with a, a, a struggle very much each time we have our hearings with the Commission, is that we really need to also demand that we have a real audit on the impact that the reforms of the different member states have. Because there is a conditionality. This money doesn't come just for free. Member states need to make the right reforms in place so that we can become more resilient, which is the name of the, of the, of the project. And if we really want to do that, we really need to have a, a real in-depth analysis of the impact of the reforms that the member states are putting into place. And we as EPP cannot allow that those reforms are not the reforms on the right path, reforms for, for progress, reforms that create more jobs, reforms that help us be more competitive. And why not talk about fiscal incentive? Why, why not talk about creating a very attractive fiscal environment within the European Union, which by the way, it's allowed to include it in the different, in the different uh, programs. So we have a huge opportunity. We are talking about the largest amount of European public money that will be sent into the, Euro uh, into the member states along with the cohesion funds. So there is only one opportunity. We really need to put pressure on, on, uh, on the member states, but also on the commission and demand transparency, demand efficiency in the spending demand real, real projects that have impact cross-border, but also at the national level, and the right reforms that gives the future generations who will be paying, will be paying for the recovery fund a real chance. So these are the, the things that we, along with uh, my colleagues, are fighting within the European Parliament, and we are constantly demanding for responsibility in the spending of the fund. Thank you very much. Yes, this. This was a very good remark because, you know, the, uh, the difference between the RRF and cohesion is that the RRF is mainly based on milestones. So that's when milestones, so the, the member states, they, they don't feel obliged to, to show what is inside the milestones. Whereas in cohesion, there are projects, so we know. When milestones, what uh, Isabella just explained, it, uh, it's very difficult for us to understand what is, what is going on. So I think I would thank you very much. Now I'd like to, flow to the, uh, give the floor to Rafał Czaskowski. By the way, going to the uh, speech of uh, Mr. Mayor Moedas, we have some mayors which are very European. <laughs> so it means that someone like, like you, Rafał, came from European level, from European Parliament to be the mayor. He is a, one of the, these mayors which are very European, not only because he speaks languages, including Portuguese, but uh, I hope that he will not speak Portuguese today, <coughs> his speech, because, but, uh, but just the information for the media. So, but th this is a question of way of thinking. I mean, this is a this different perspective. I mean, the, the way, of, so I, uh, uh, with a big pleasure and honor, I give the floor to Rafał, who is the uh, mayor of Warsaw, former member of European Parliament, and you will see what it really means to be European ma mayor. Please, the floor is yours. 
Bom dia. Não fala português, por posso atingir quase todos. Queria agradecer o convite a todos os membros. Thank you. The invitation. I like to thank the invitation address. To thank my friend José Manuel Carlos Siegfried. To be able to, to, to be able to talk about uh, what's in store, even though Poland, as you know, is not using the recovery money yet because of uh, the fact that the government is breaking the rule of law. Uh, even though we have quite a few, uh, quite a few things to, to say about it and to share with you. First of all, because we focus on the rule of law and we focus on the money. But you have to understand this, that uh, the recovery plan, uh, this is a plan for the modernization of Europe and modernization of, of Poland, and people keep forgetting about it. I mean, we have been modernizing our countries for the past 30 years, and now we need an additional push. After COVID, after the war, uh, in times of energy crisis and so on and so forth, that's exactly what we need. This is like a, uh, a medicine that, that, that we need to uh, keep on moving and to make Europe competitive. And if you look at the recovery plans uh, for some of our countries, the agenda is there. And by the way, this is an agenda that includes the work of the regional governments and of the mayors. Because if you talk about the agenda, this is innovation, digitization, green agenda, even urban planning is there. Uh, things like transportation, things like uh, affordable housing and so on and so forth. All of, those, all of those priorities are there. And let me tell you one thing. You cannot do it without the regional and local governments. You cannot do it without the cities. That's why it is so absolutely crucial that this plan, its implementation, it's not centralized. And that's what the government do. And moreover, they're politicizing the whole process. And we all know the, the cohesion policy, how many strings are attached to it, so that the European institutions can actually watch the process in implementation. Whereas the recovery plan is totally centralized, it was given to the governments to actually play with, and that's why we need to have some control over what's going on. And I mean, when it comes to the politicization, the politicization process, as far as I know, because of course, you know, the plan is not being implemented in Poland for, for obvious reasons, uh, there were quite a lot of tricks employed by uh, the conservative government to actually make it impossible or at least very difficult for cities to use the money. For example, when it comes to uh, buying uh, low emission buses, you know, the uh, procurement is so small, only for 20 or 30 or 40 buses, uh, as to make it almost impossible uh, for the big cities to use it. So we need the regional authorities to be consulted, and it's not only in the preparation process, because of course that's long gone, but when it comes to evaluation and uh, putting it all uh, in practice. That's why I think our role is so important, because we are going to be uh, involved in uh, putting it in place, but also because we really know how to do it, because we have been spending money for the past uh, European money for the past 20 or 25 years. We have the, the projects, we have the know-how, and on top of that we are so well connected thanks to the Committee of the Regions, thanks to uh, other institutions which uh, help us network, uh, help us exchange uh, our experiences so that we can make sure that what we do is actually going to be used, it's going to be affordable, it's going to be effective, and that's why the role of the regional um, and local authorities is so absolutely crucial. Uh, and I would uh, end with one thing, with one plea, because I keep on uh, fighting for it with the Committee of the Regions, with the Euro Cities, with the Pact of Free Cities. We all are saying one thing. In those difficult times, look at what's happening. Most of the responsibility for most of the challenges that are ahead of us are shifted to the local and regional authorities. I'm not responsible for, for dealing with pandemics. I'm not responsible for dealing with wars and refugees. I'm not responsible on paper for dealing with energy crisis. Yet I'm dealing with all of those things in Warsaw. And I would submit to you that, that, that more effectively than the central government. And if you want digital Europe, if you want modern Europe, if you want fight, to fight global change, changes and global warming seriously, if you want to have good quality of air, you need to do it with the cities. You cannot keep us out of that. That's why we are fighting for a small direct financing for the cities. Of course, most of the money, 95% will still go to national envelopes. But we need to do that. That's why the projects like 100 Green Cities are so important. That's why we need to keep on pushing for such product projects to include us. And on recovery plan, if you do not consult us, if you do not take our views into consideration, the money will not be used in the most effective way. So this is... Uh, in the interest of all of us to include, to include regional and local uh, authorities 
because if you want real modernization, you got to do it with us. And if you don't believe that, come to Lisbon, come to Warsaw, come to the region of Madrid, come to Braga, look around and see how our cities have changed thanks to the European money, but also thanks to the people who know how to do it. So once again, thank you very much, muito obrigado, and let's go on with the fascinating discussion. Yes, it was a European voice from Poland. And uh, so, they, but, uh, okay, so this, they are the perspective from outside of Portugal. Let's look on the situation in Portugal. So, uh, I'm uh, together with uh, Siegfried and uh, Jose Manuel, we are the members of the special group which is monitoring the, uh, the plans in each European country. So, we are trying to follow the information, what the information we can get. And of course, the, uh, this information, when I was preparing myself, I read that the that in Portugal you have a, a functioning monitoring committee. And I would like to ask, uh, uh, among the other things, Mr. Antonio Saraiva, the uh, president of Confederation of Portuguese Business, what is the reality in Portugal? I mean, do you have this kind of uh, uh, strong participation of different stakeholders, including business, uh, in this monitoring and implementation, etc.? Please, the floor is yours. Following Zé Manel Fernandes, uh, I will speak in Portuguese. I've prepared 12 points since I only have three minutes. The positive scenario, we're experiencing a slowdown of the economic activity. There's a clear deterioration and uh, the company's feeling is not very positive. The growth rate foreseen for the, by the government for 2023, 1.3%, is based on a forecast of a greater dynamism of our investment. However, this is a risky assumption once the, on, the business investment will be impacted by an increase of uncertainty, financing costs, and also an increase of the difficulties related to supply and demand of material and equipment, especially, and I would like to add, by the deterioration of our expectations. The uh, RRF is quite important in relation to what is being felt. More than half of the increase of the public investment for 2023 should be from its execution. And it's also decisive as a stimulus for business investment. And we could look uh, back and criticize the basic options underlining the uh, um, RRF. Uh, if I'm convinced that it does not translate the priority given to companies in the recovery pro process and transformation of the Portuguese economy. And also we could criticize the lack of involvement of our social partners in its development. The process has been, and I should acknowledge, is to has been improved and consultations have been more frequent. So what is important now is to make sure that we invest duly and that we execute, implement quickly, because more than just announcing is to execute, implement. Portugal will have to implement and execute more than 6 billion euros in European funds per year, um, uh, counting on the P uh, in the uh, RAF structural funds, it only exists you execute 3 billion euros. So we're going to have to double the use, and I hope correct use of these same funds. We also have, we, we face a tremendous uh, challenge. We can only execute these funds. And if there is a strict collaboration between the private and public sector in total transparency and um, considering the companies as businesses as a partner for this common objective. We have to think about the innovative form to invest these values where it's important and not just to insist on different processes. That's why we strongly applauded the mobilizing uh, agenda. In terms of its real impact, it's still early. According to the last uh, published uh, uh, numbers, hiring 70% uh, approvals as well, payment 9%, and, uh, and only 10% reached the companies. Now, in terms of the local authorities' participation, metropolitan uh, approvals exceed uh, certain um, um, notices. Um, 
which are far from what has been approved. In the current context, I can only look at these numbers with concern, and then we will look at this RAF with a great attention and demand. Usually, I normally say that just recovering the Portuguese economy, we need to know how to transform it more than recovering transforming is important and that's why our economic development model uh, requires deep changes reforms political reforms which have been, been carried out and since we have uh, a parliament with the majority of a party it's it's time for these reforms to be carried out to transform taking advantage of these opportunities window of opportunity as Emmanuel Fernandes mentioned at least a window to be a, a, to be used in a sh in the short term, we need we need to know how to correct some anomalies to transform the Portuguese economy, and by complying with three objectives. And these uh, three objectives is the dimension were composed by micro, uh, small enterprise. We need to transform. We need to increase. We need to aggregate. So first dimension. Second of all, innovation requires investment. Investment capital. So it's important to be able to use these funds to transform the Portuguese economy. And with these two uh, previous objectives, scale, scale, dimension, innovation, we'll be able to achieve a better internationalization. And by, uh, by meeting these three objectives, we'll be able to transform our economy. This opportunity cannot be lost. This investment has to be carried out. It's not enough to announce it, but it has to be executing. That's why we want to make sure that it does happen. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, now, because we have two mayors in the, so I will ask both of them. Of course, the something which is linking directly to the uh, to the topic of this panel, which is what about consultation with local government in Portugal, How, uh, and what about the participation in the implementation of the program, which is ongoing. This is the first element, but this is the first element. Second element, I uh, would like to ask the, uh, the, mayor of, uh, the mayor of Braga. You know, when, we, uh, uh, when, when uh, Mayor Moedas uh, explained the, the, the strategy of Lisbon, in fact, it was about the changing the approach. This is about the reforms, reforming the behavior. Of, of the uh, local there's you have in, in the uh, in the Portuguese plan you have more than 30 big reforms 30 big reforms I mean the, these reforms cannot 34 I think so uh, without the local government these reforms will not be possible to, to be made so I think that the, the question is what about consultation of the local authorities and what about the participation of the local authorities in the reforms what Isabel has said at the beginning is just it's not just about money because the money cannot be spent without reforms. So if there is no reforms, the money will not be spent. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan, and greetings uh, to all the participants. Uh, special thanks to uh, Siegfried, Siegfried and uh, José Manuel Fernandes, all dear colleagues from the European Parliament, dear colleagues from the Committee of the Regions, mayors, um, meu caro amigo Carlos Moedas, nosso belíssimo anfitrião. Um, it is a pleasure to participate in this session. Uh, even if uh, the news that I can share about the Portuguese uh, implementation of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan is, are not so good, uh, especially in terms of what was the process that led to this moment. Um, as uh, it was mentioned, the RRF was brought to light in a very special moment in Europe, gathering the will of all the member states, gathering an expectation that it will be something that will cause a huge impact and a big transformation in all the territories. And to do so, I think that it will be beyond our imagination not to involve the authorities that are more conscious of what are the needs of each of the communities, which are more capable of fulfilling each of the projects, which are the regional and local authorities. That's what we have been advising many, many times, as Rafa said, in the Committee of the Regions, in Eurocities and many other international networks. And in Portugal, we had a very nice strategic document that was initially prepared by the current Minister of Economy. But then when it was translated to the actual natural recovery and resilience plan, it was a big source of disappointment. Because it didn't fill the expectations, 
it didn't engage most of the stakeholders, not only the local and regional authorities, but uh, as we've heard, the other civic society uh, stakeholders. And uh, the projects were mainly decided on a centralized base, and centralized base in many levels. Centralized base because they um, focused mainly in the needs of the national government, of the national authorities, rather than the other institutions. Centralized because the management was fully concentrated in Lisbon and uh, in the, the national government and didn't, for instance, took into account uh, the recommendation that we had in the northern region to allocate the specific amount of the funds directly to the region, which was by then 47% of the funds. Uh, it was centralized in terms of geography because uh, we looked at the projects and they were mainly distributed to the metropolitan areas of Lisbon and Porto, even if some other cities all across the country had the same needs and had the same will to develop projects. Braga, which is one of the major uh, cities in Portugal in terms of growth of population, in terms of economic development, as I used to kid, only appeared once in the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, and it was in the word Bragança. So it, it was not for Braga itself. Uh, and uh, we saw that all over the territory, and I think that was a, a misconception of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. But then what we saw, it was also that, for instance, even when we had specific priorities that were, were interesting, for instance, the investment on cultural sites and cultural equipment, they were all concentrated in the ones that belonged to the national state. So every single venue that belongs to a local authority or that is implemented in the territory wasn't uh, eligible for that type of funding. And uh, I think that uh, after this uh, process, um, things have been slightly improving. We have been watching uh, a lot of calls being issued, and in Braga, good things are happening. We have just approved an application to do the biggest students' residence, new students' residence in the country, with an investment of over 25 million euros for 700 beds. We have uh, been approving several applications in terms of uh, refurbishment and reconstruction of households for families that are low income and uh, according to the Primeiro Direito program we are now investing over 10 million euros in hundreds of houses for, for families but there's still a long way to go and I think that for the future I'll just end sharing four brief concerns. One is reinforcing Carlos idea about the time of implementation because it's not only about the time for new projects, even for the ones that are being developed and taking into account the current circumstances, we are having a huge difficulty to have people applying for the tenders, uh, to have the projects uh, processed. And so I think that to an, an extension of the timing is crucial to be successful in this area. The second is connected with costs because now we are looking at what is the difficulty to uh, reach some supplies in terms of raw materials for the construction sector, for instance. We are looking at difficulties in terms of cost of energy. We are looking at difficulties in terms of lack of uh, workers. And this is increasing hugely the cost of all the projects, which obviously creates a big difficulty for the implementation of them. The third dimension, which is very connected with Portugal, and you mentioned about reforms, we are going under a decentralization process right now. And I think under many difficulties, there is something that this decentralization process is showing to light, which is the lack of responsibility and commitment of the national government to crucial areas and the well-being of the people. If we look at the quality of the infrastructures in the health area or in the education area, we have a sense of urgency of uh, projects that need to be developed and that should be allocated under the RRF or the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. But the national government, for instance, is diverting those investments towards the new framework, the Portugal 2030, and trying to steal, in a sense, money from the local authorities to uh, provide funding for these efforts that should be made by the national government. And my final remark, because I'm also the rapporteur of the Committee of the Regions for the Sustainable Development Goals, it's that in the design and conception of the plans, most of the national recovery and resilience plans didn't address the Sustainable Development Goals at all. I think that in the phase of implementation, in the phase of the monitoring, we need to see how these are matching the, the projects that are being developed towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you.
Yes, uh, thank you, Ricardo. And the, let's not forget that the, the whole RRF has been created because of, firstly, because of the COVID. So the, uh, this was the first reaction, let's, let's find the money on the market, let's make the urgent and temporary solution, and let's make it quick and fast, etc. But because of this COVID, the, the element of social pillar of this is, is from the very beginning very important. And then you look at all the documents, you have the uh, climate, you have digital, but also social. So the question is, what about <laughs> participation of stakeholders from this sector, from the social uh, matters uh, in Portugal? So I would like to, uh, to ask uh, Mr. Man uh, Emmanuel Lemos, the president of the Union of Portuguese Medicines. Please, the floor is yours. Muito bom dia. Eu queria começar por uh, agradecer este convite, nomeadamente do Good morning, I'd like to um, thank the invitation addressed by uh, Zé Manuel Fernandes to speak to you how we see the implementation of our RP following the different um, aspects that Portugal and Europe has experienced because of COVID. Let me say that uh, José Manuel Fernandes was uh, the mayor of a city hall that related quite well with uh, its mercies, not only for the social development of that community, but also so that people would live better and would be happier. That's the reason of our presence here today. Um, some, uh, uh, another remark, and uh, the mercies are civil society organizations, people that help, that gather to help, and it's a principle of European solidarities that the Portuguese have shown during the discoveries in the 17th century, that is uh, a Portuguese uh, a pattern, three Portuguese uh, uh, mercies and two Portuguese an embrace. And that is why today the largest, largest uh, European organization is um, located in Asia and in Brazil spreading our, the word in uh, the word of the mercies where there are 2,000 or so more and in Latin America and many other countries where the European ideal, as was mentioned yesterday, the freedom, solidarity is not only affirmed, it is practice, put into practice. It is something which is quite interesting and very distinctive. In our case, in Portugal, we're concerned, especially concerned at this moment, um, our main preoccupation, our main concern are the elderly, protecting the elderly. And it's within that context that we've been, that we were able to resist during uh, COVID. We developed several social responses, special, uh, we developed quite a lot of, uh, special, of uh, social responses that unfortunately in three minutes, uh, unfortunately three minutes are not enough. And the RRP is a great opportunity because something uh, which is sure is that we are going to live older. So we need to look at demography and longevity in a serious way. The RRP uh, has disappointed us and has been disappointing us for two reasons. First of all, uh, the welcome given to the social sector did not match the Portuguese reality in the matter. And when it happened, uh, the values, the values, um, uh, for instance, the social health areas, long-term care, as the Spanish uh, have mentioned, for that is contribution support does not exceed 30% of any investment and 30% investment still when men still even if there are many agreements in practice this is not going to be translated into achievements so therefore innovation everything that we are trying to do and it's true as mentioned by Anton Saraiva and it also has to be said that today there's a greater 
link, but there's a greater link. We would st we would still to carry out different actions, and as uh, Emmanuel Fernandes mentioned, we might lose an opportunity. We might lose this opportunity. Yes, so uh, this is uh, again uh, uh, showing that uh, what we would like to. Uh, to know is not only uh, how much money is possible, the money is uh, first how the money is spent, but what about the, the results? What about the, uh, the achievements? What about the consequence? How the money is spent in terms of concrete, concrete elements? I mean, Isabella has told me about at the beginning, but we are still in the same, same level. Of course, the, what we are really interested is what, what is the, the, con the consequence, the result of, of, of this money? This is not the question of okay, we, there is the money we should spend it. I mean, this is the this is not the political way of thinking. The political way of thinking is how to make it correctly, how to make the real results. And um, our last panel is not most not least, uh, uh, Mr. Duarte Novo, who is, if I can pronounce it very correctly, Mayor of Oliveira de Bayro. It's okay. So let's uh, let's go to the point. Let's be very frank. Um, because this is the last panelist. Will you do it? I mean, do you have enough time to do it? Uh, 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 because the, the time is very limited. The time is absolutely limited. So the question, from my, from my point of view, as a practitioner, if you want to make it to the half of 26, it should be the project which are almost ready, prepared. And who, where are the projects? The projects are in the local government. They are, they are prepared and ready, etc. If we start in, in, a, in the investment process, normal investment process, you will not manage. So the question is, what is your situation? Where do you manage? I mean, are you enough time to do it? Or at the end, you will say, sorry, I will not do it. So this is, sorry, it's very practical, but no, let's, let's say it, because we as members of the parliament would like to know it. Because very often we say, this time limited, is not very, very efficient. So because we will be in, in a very difficult, we understand all the problems with the financial market, et cetera, et cetera. But okay, let's go to reality, mayor of the city. Will you manage? Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, this, invi this opportunity given to a small region Oliveira do Bairro, very well-known region in the Bairrada, to be able to speak to you about our relationship, opportunity, and how it coexists, how it takes advantage of opportunities to develop itself. And it's when our colleague from Braga mentioned the problem, the problems regarding the the RRP how it was idealized, and some examples um, that were said. I'm going to pick on two or three examples. I'm going to be objective. The strategy for local housing, um, a strategy that the municipality of Oliveira do Bar is using, and is um, with funds, uh, but which is extremely necessary, but then uh, there were problems in our country that never happened. There was a real estate reform, and the uh, country's uh, real estate aspects. Oliveira do Bar, with uh, projects that were ready, uh, was faced with the problem of not being able to uh, put in the housing market that real estate uh, for students, for families, th those more needy families. There's one, it, it, there's, it's been a year that we've tried to buy housing and we've been, not been able to do. There are 6,000 dwellings which are not inhabited, which are inhabited. And the uh, municipality's strategy is not to build new ones, but it's to recover those that are derelict and to give life, again, give life to the city, to downtown and its cities, to the center. And we're not able to do so because there's a bureaucratic apparatus behind it that has hampered the fact that we're able to acquire, purchase, when it's the market that is booming uh, w with its prices booming makes it impossible for the local authority to uh, uh, 
purchase this real estate, there has to be different reforms so before we start investing. Uh, 2026 is very short for us to be able to uh, carry out this investment. The municipality does not have 10 million, it has 6 million, which are for that investment. And it has already uh, localized many of these houses, but is not able to unblock um, the industrial expansion growth. We can't grow if we do not have companies or industries. How can the municipality uh, start with this expansion? Olivera do Bar is expanding 100 hectares in strategic locations. And uh, then in order to actually buy the uh, plot of land, it will take um, three to four years. You know, there's so much bureaucracy that it takes a lot of time. So how can we respond to a uh, an entrepreneur who asks for uh, infrastructures to be available? How can I get to Europe? How can I... Uh, and my colleagues in, in my region, we've proposed that uh, one of the needs that should be included in the RRF uh, would be a fast connection to Spain and then to Europe. Why isn't this included as one of the objectives of uh, our, uh, RRF? And this is... Uh, we think that uh, economic growth and social growth is important for the growth of our territories. If we create a set of obstacles to municipalities, you know, and that actually go against the, the longings of their populations and the country, how can we spend, you know, the funds that are available? And I understand that investment should be made in these areas. Private initiative is forgotten, but public initiative uh, should actually meet uh, uh, private initiative. But it is limited by this type of circumstances. Michael Lee from Braga spoke about the decentralization of competences. Well, in fact, we are working with this without means to actually be able to achieve the primary objectives of this decentralization of uh, competences. We cannot promote education if we do not have the means. Uh, the uh, equipment need to be restructured, and we do not know exactly how they will be financed. At Oliver de Bar, we felt that we should prepare a set of projects. Uh, our strategy can't be uh, just uh, uh, done, you know, having uh, financing in mon mind or fun funding in mind. We need to think what we really want to do, and this is what we're trying to do at Oliver de Bar. We're trying to transmit very clearly which is our strategy, where exactly we want to be, socially speaking, economically speaking, and also uh, culturally speaking. Of course, we are a municipality with uh, 23,000 inhabitants, one of the smallest municipalities in the Aveiro region. But I also feel that it is not just the municipality of Oliveira do Barro, but uh, the whole region, because they all think the same way. and. Um, uh, the uh, mayors are uh, thinking along the same lines and with regards to the, the uh, what they feel is the most important for the growth of their region. Thank you very much. So it's quite clear this the discussion is uh, you see very well that not having a very close cooperation with local authorities and the other stockholders is not the question is not correct. This is just a very serious mistake. This is a serious mistake, because this mistake, which can be very costly, you know, because if there is no close cooperation, it, it came from the outside of Portugal, but also from Portugal, I mean, this is the same. We have about 10 minutes for two, three questions to the uh, panelists. Next, I will ask Jules Manuel to, to make the, uh, uh, the uh, summary of this debate, but if you have any re questions or remarks to the panelists, please 
raise your hand and introduce yourself. Anybody wants to take the floor? If it's not the case, I will give the floor to Giovanni Mori. I will speak again in Portuguese, please. Bem, o PPE, well, PPA, um, corrected things, and uh, we uh, were the ones that uh, were able to have an article, you know, for consultation of local uh, stakeholders. But the Portuguese government, um, you know, just pretended that uh, uh, this consultation had been made. Uh, we consider that local powers, regional powers, companies and social stakeholders, institutions such as the Mercies, uh, are essential to uh, create quality projects. We need quality projects and they know better than uh, anyone else uh, what is needed. And they would, uh, they should be involved in the creation of a plan and creating uh, regulations. And these regulations are very important for a good execution. Many companies are uh, able to, are, are, are compelled to actually torture uh, projects, you know, so that they fit in the regulations and then they are useless. So the regulations and the involvement of local powers is uh, a very important step for success. And other stakeholders, such as the Mercies, are very important for the success and the implementation of the uh, RRF. Another conclusion, 2026 for the execution of uh, RRF goes against the quality of projects. I believe we will execute everything, we will spend everything, but it is not enough to spend. We need to invest, we need to invest well. We need to guarantee the future, the future of all the territory and of all Portuguese. With regards to this issue of 2026, the EPP and Siegfried Morrison, that was uh, the leader of these negotiations, uh, uh, tried to, uh, to, to, to go up to 2027. Member states did not accept uh, this, you know. They shot uh, uh, themselves, uh, so to speak. We uh, will probably not be able to change, you know, a uh, change on this uh, date, 2027, uh, provided we have a majority in the uh, uh, council, um, we will have this uh, authorization. But I also understand the commission. The member states have uh, lots of uh, uh, millions that are being not that are not being used, and the calendar is a problem here. 2014-2020 needs to be executed until uh, 2023. We have about 4,500 million euros unused. We set at Portugal uh, 2030s uh, from 2021 to 2029, but we are already in 2023, and uh, we have not executed the 4 million from Portugal 2020. So which is going to be the financial execution at the Portugal 20, uh, uh, 2020, 30 this year? Zero. They are delaying things on purpose. And then we have the uh, RRF. And uh, governments enjoy RRF, but socialist governments just love RRF. They just love it because it's 100% uh, uh, money, no national co-financing. It uh, even increases the state budget. It is centralized. They do as they wish. So they pretend they hear, but they 
down here. Uh, and they use this calendar and these amounts depending on the uh, elections calendar. Well, uh, and, and then we have Portugal 2030. They are governing in favor of the, con the, the party and not in favor of the country. And uh, we need to uh, govern uh, for a specific objective and, and of course, for Portugal. We do not have cross-border projects, and this uh, uh, is something that did not materialize. The Union of Energy interconnections. If we look into the uh, object, the, uh, into digital, we uh, do not have inter, um, We do not have uh, this kind of uh, uh, cross-border projects. The Commission will uh, come up with a proposal, uh, but uh, if they do that, they will relax member states and they will delay execution. And this execution is uh, absolutely essential. Now, I would like to think of another aspect. Uh, local powers have uh, an increasing uh, number of, of uh, competencies. Uh, and, uh, you know, with regards to the pandemic, to the uh, consequences of the war, um, local powers are the ones that are in the field and that uh, uh, have to, to, to provide some response. Uh, uh, but central governments um, are not really um, implied in this. They could do much more. Another aspect has to do with transparency. We proposed to have in the regulations an article for the creation of a digital platform so that we could uh, be familiar with all the final beneficiaries of uh, RRF and to know where, where the um, funds are used. It is unbelievable, but for instance in Spain, uh, they're not aware exactly where the uh, funds from RRF are, are being allocated. So we wanted to have a digital platform, uh, a simple thing to actually uh, show which are the final beneficiaries of RRF. The Council and the Member States did not uh, accept. We uh, had to uh, issue a statement so that this objective uh, uh, could be materialized and that uh, this uh, uh, and to recommend this to member states. Another conclusion regarding the articulation of funds. Now, if you look into Portugal, we have, according to the EU Commission, our RRF has less impact than Greece's RRF or Croatia's RRF um, in terms of uh, GDP growth. Uh, this is because we don't know what we want, because pr first of all, we present RRF, then we present uh, Portugal 2030, uh, no articulation whatsoever. We have elements of Portugal 2030 uh, or elements of uh, uh, RRF that uh, could be in um, Portugal 2030. Uh, and now we have things that we could be doing via RRF that uh, will not materialize because we did not have this uh, articulation between RRF, Portugal 2030, uh, which is the partnership agreement, and uh, this uh, requires some other thing that uh, has been mentioned here as well. The fact that projects that are being approved locally should be part of a national strategy where one uh, tries to find uh, synergies and achieve objectives that should be common objectives. In the regulations, we've uh, included several axes, and one of them is uh, territorial cohesion. Another one for, was for SMEs, thinking of the, this objective of local uh, powers uh, in their integration 
uh, in development is because competitiveness is essential. But we can't have competitiveness without cohesion. Social and uh, social development is paramount. But in order to achieve that, we need to have uh, economic uh, development. And Antonio Saraf and Manuel Lemos are two. Uh, examples and we uh, know from uh, what they've said that uh, you know uh, uh, we need to have this com uh, this these two actions so we are losing uh, an opportunity uh, due to the lack of quality of projects they can't be um, designed uh, overnight and then we have very easy reforms, you know, for for s to, to spend our money. Um, if we have any difficulties implementing, they will increase uh, the amount for each of the project. This is no strategy whatsoever. This is the same thing that uh, is being done to um, execute Portugal 2030. Local powers have their own strength. They need to. Uh, demand their involvement as part of the RRF. We have an additional of uh, 1.6 uh, billion euro. Romania uh, has a decrease vis-à-vis uh, -vis initial RRF, and this uh, 1.6 billion euro could be used to actually do um, something that was not planned for. Where are we going to use that? Our uh, RRF uh, has uh, more uh, 1.6 billion euros. Uh, uh, now with Repower uh, U uh, for energy, we have an extra 700 million. Now, so we have overall 15,000 million in, in subsidies, but we will have uh, uh, that amount in, in, in loans. Uh, so thank you very much for the quality of uh, your interventions. Ricardo Rio is also a uh, model mayor, and he said that uh, municipalities were not involved. and. Uh, this is not something to reinforce the power of the uh, uh, mayors, uh, or local powers, uh, but it has to do with national interest. Uh, democracy would be more respected if that uh, uh, was to become a reality. Uh, and uh, I believe that we uh, would this way guarantee the quality of projects. So, Thank you very much. We now have a coffee break. After the coffee break, we'll be back for the second panel.
Dear colleagues, welcome back to the second session, the second panel of our event this morning. The title of our second panel is Enhancing Synergies Between the Recovery Funds and the Traditional EU Funds, Key to a Speedy Recovery and Resilience. We will have again a distinct panel with us for the second panel, but before the panel starts, we will have a key address by one of the most prominent EPP leaders at regional level in Europe, and this is the president of the Madrid community, Isabel Diaz Ayuso. Isabel, thank you very much for being with us this morning. Thank you very much for coming from Madrid to Lisbon to be with the EPP, to be with your political family. Isabel is a winner. She won elections in Madrid. She will keep on winning elections in Madrid, and she is a developer. She develops Madrid. She makes Madrid attractive for entrepreneurs, for investments. She shows that job creation, growth can happen in Spain if political leadership is right. And I say if it happens, if it can happen in Madrid under her leadership, it can happen in the whole of Spain. We are very happy, Isabel, that you are with your political family uh, where you will always be received by friends. Internationally, we are happy to hear from you what uh, happens in Madrid, how you are developing Madrid. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming to Lisbon. Uh, you will always be a friend of Lisbon. The floor is yours, please. Alcalde de Lisboa, señor Carlos Moedas, presidente del Grupo del Partido Popular Europeo en el Comité de las Regiones, vicepresidente del Grupo Parlamentario Popular Europeo, miembros del Parlamento Europeo, miembros del Grupo Parlamentario Popular del Comité de las Regiones, autoridades de los gobiernos regionales y municipales de los Estados miembros de la Unión Europea que nos acompañan, presidente de la Confederación de Empresas de Portugal, Queridos amigos, muy buenos días a todos. En primer lugar, quiero daros las gracias por invitarme a compartir las razones del éxito de la Comunidad de Madrid. En política, creo que es fundamental preguntarnos para qué estamos aquí. En política, creo que es importante decir por qué estamos aquí. Y me gustaría que estuviera mucho más allá del corto plazo, que va más allá de recaudar, que es lo fácil en política, va de gestionar y de defender unos valores. Y también va de, de defender que no estamos en política. Conseguir las cosas uh, y de defender que nosotros no estamos en política. Si hubiera que resumir con dos palabras lo que estamos haciendo en Madrid a través de nuestra... Dos palabras, lo que hemos estado haciendo en Madrid via nuestras políticas, podemos decir que defender la vida y la libertad which are the two most important assets that uh, we have. Madrid is more fashionable than ever with uh, uh, creating uh, creative means to actually develop our city during the pandemic. And this took us to the international um, window. And uh, we are now a place of contrasts, of talents, of uh, openness. We are an example that the uh, welfare state can go together with a solid economy, liberal economy, that is capable of improving the life of our citizens and very important without uh, actually um, withdrawing the projects that we need to implement and without hyper regulation and without absurd norms. It is also, uh, it also has to do with respect for property, for companies and for families. And this is why we are the most important economy in Spain with the lowest debt, with the highest salaries. And uh, we are the one that creates most jobs and where uh, foreign investment is more concentrated. And we are also a place in the world that surprises people due to the capacity that we have um, important events such as the NATO summit, the climate summit, uh, J&J. &J. We also have lots of uh, uh, 
public hospitals that are recognized internationally, the best European health system, and uh, we are always trying to develop uh, uh, important projects and uh, we have the best nightlife capital of culture and of uh, digitization and this was achieved thanks to governments of the popular party in the community of Madrid we are reducing uh, taxes uh, in a careful manner of course and uh, uh, we have an history of 18 years and the results are there to show what we've done. I would like to sum up our policies in uh, several aspects. One, first of all, is um, economic freedom and openness. We have economic activity um, uh, that is totally free. We have a total uh, freedom uh, with regards to the opening hours of business. Uh, and citizens can, in fact, choose uh, the hours they would like to um, attend these kind, this, this uh, places and, and shop. We have uh, an open uh, a law for an open market, and an entrepreneur that uh, is located elsewhere in the country can, in fact, operate in the community of Madrid without any further barriers. Now. Um, young entrepreneurs, freelancers uh, have lots of difficulties. As we know, we believe in a fair uh, taxation. And obviously, you need to pay taxes not to, in order to um, implement uh, whatever is important for people. And um, this way, we've demonstrated that uh, we are a competitive region, the most competitive region in Spain, and also one of the most competitive regions in Europe, where uh, those who have less pay less taxes. But we are also the only uh, region that has not its own uh, uh, taxes uh, designed to meet the ambitions of the administrations. We have foreign investment, and uh, we believe that uh, sometimes the government of Sanchez uh, works against the community of Madrid. They've created a, a tax that almost does not exist in the EU, and the government has uh, wants to, uh, in fact, extend this tax to the region of Madrid. Uh, also uh, taking into consideration that 65% of foreign invest, uh, investment happens in Madrid. We are uh, allocating uh, also a good share of our resources to um, social policies. We are aware that people have uh, certain problems, problems that need to be responded to. We have uh, a depth of uh, 13.6% uh, against 127% uh, of the central government. We cannot spend what we do not have, and we cannot burden future generations with a debt that will mortgage their future. We also facilitate the freedom of choice, the choice of public services, and uh, to do that, citizens pay their taxes. We were the first region, and um, I believe so far the first one, that allows citizens to actually uh, choose the education model that they want uh, their children to attend. There are preferences, and uh, this uh, grants them the possibility to actually choose the form of uh, education that they uh, want their children to attend, uh, uh, especially for children with special needs. Uh, we have a bilingual offer, and uh, people in the Madrid regions can choose their health center or hospital, and that's what they pay for. We have the government that makes less public expenditure in the country. We always... Um, account for our expenses in the parliament and um, we also support citizens in their personal decisions among uh, which we would like to, to, to um, 
support those that are connected with the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems that we have, which is uh, um, the birth rate. We've in created an innovative uh, uh, plan in order to overcome uh, barriers, economic barriers, such as uh, uh, housing, uh, that uh, will prevent us from being in the future a region that can move forward. In Europe, we have an increasing number of uh, uh, deserted villages. We will be living longer, but we will uh, be part of an aging population. And uh, we are isolating people, children that have uh, uh, problems or with regards to accessing or not accessing, but rather addiction to new technologies. They use technologies, new technologies inadequately. And uh, also among the elderly uh, who are um, alone, we have uh, less uh, children, less brothers. We are increasingly more isolated. And uh, solitude is going to be the big pandemic of the 21st century. And we want to have this in our political agenda. What we do is to look into Madrid uh, during the next decades. We are not just looking to ourselves. We uh, want to know exactly uh, where we want to uh, go to. We want to transform our society. We want to be in charge. And uh, we have uh, the next generation funds from the EU. They are being managed in our country uh, in a manner that is uh, has very little transparency, and they uh, really don't take in mind the short and the long term, and they, they do not take into consideration the way we manage hospitals or schools. Besides, uh, you know, th the distribution of funding is done in an ideological manner, uh, and usually if the uh, this kind of expenditure is. Uh, preserved to the end of the, uh, the legislature to actually uh, buy votes. Now, we don't, uh, s the use of these fundings uh, doesn't really uh, try to change the situation among farmers, for instance, uh, and uh, among the population. Um, and uh, we uh, want to actually work together with entrepreneurs, uh, with uh, uh, those that are independent at, that are not connected to any uh, form of power. We um, are working uh, in order to preserve our natural and cultural heritage. Uh, they don't belong to us here. They belong to the next generations, and it is for that that we are implementing true environmental policies. I would like to ask, we speak about environment and ecology. These are very important challenges. Now we have technological tools and knowledge, but why is it that we abandon our uh, natural and cultural heritage, uh, Europe and the Mediterranean uh, is burning. We are always... Uh, um, listening to, to people uh, uh, speaking about the ways uh, uh, funding should be transferred. And every summer, um, uh, we have these forest fires. Now, we in the Madrid community, we've planned against fires with the best tools. And uh, the funds are not just used for that. They are uh, actually used. Uh, for uh, policies that sometimes uh, do not really uh, get to people. No doubt people from Madrid are very um, concerned with the environment and the quality of the air. And, um, and uh, we uh, see, for instance, that uh, we are implementing a decarbonization plan there are lots of contrasts in the region of Madrid, uh, where we have the second most important national park in Spain. We are planting half a million of Spain in a, a legislature that uh, wants to be green. This uh, will cover 
uh, an, an area of 20 kilometers of flora and fauna biodiversity to actually build forests inside town so that the new generations can in fact have the opportunity of living in environments that are much more natural. We are also working together uh, with the uh, northern um, area of Madrid uh, investments that are bringing together investments for investors from all over the world um, to recycle water. But we also want to be a reference of individual freedom for those that have uh, uh, fled their country due to um, nationalist policies. Uh, and uh, the only thing that they want to do is to live in a peaceful manner. Um, according to their beliefs. We will never stop defending democracy and the rule of law and strong institutions. This is the last resource that uh, the citizen has whenever he loses everything. So I would like to use this uh, forum to actually ask uh, liberal democracies to take care of each other because uh, what happens in a country when this uh, uh, freedom um, disappears is, is negative for all, otherwise the world would be increasingly less free. Freedom of expression is uh, most likely the form of freedom that is most uh, um, condemned uh, around the world by totalitarianism. And um, this is uh, something that we need to tackle the uh, divisions between different identities. Uh, we always try to actually find uh, the best way to, to, to help people so that they are able to maintain their lives and their lively livelihood. At uh, present, I would like to say that uh, um, There are big uh, threats uh, around the um, election elections, and uh, we believe in freedom, life, and prosperity, and uh, we need to uh, care for each other to actually um, help people all over the world where so many people do not uh, go to school, have uh, are not entitled to uh, basic schooling. So many women are uh, prosecuted. There are uh, security issues and also uh, a handful of problems that uh, we need to respond to. Some of them, some of these people get to uh, Madrid and uh, they tell us that they've lost their country and they don't want to lose uh, their second country. So we need to uh, implement all this in Spain. Yesterday we uh, had uh, events that uh, make us denounce everything that uh, all the um, everything that is perpetrated against freedom and um, we uh, need to sometimes overcome uh, we, we need to overcome all these problems and we need to defend the, the values. This is uh, uh, something that is happening today in Madrid, a very uh, uh, lively community um, made of people uh, that, uh, uh, of course, uh, represent are represented by us. We represent the people, uh, people from uh, left to right, children, uh, and to the uh, uh, elderly, and uh, we also uh, think about liberal uh, policies that are being implemented uh, uh, all over the world. Uh, we need to uh, denounce uh, um, the places where the rules of the game are not being met. In our case, probably we are the only ones in Europe that uh, is being governed by a pact between uh, left and uh, uh, what we do in, in Madrid is uh, uh, that uh, this, uh, these are situations that happen with uh, authoritarian, uh, authoritarian governments and uh, some 
think that the ends justify the means. They did not respect the results of the elections, and uh, they don't really care um, much for democracy. And they think that they can uh, accuse uh, politicians for the state of events. Uh, there are obstacles to democracy. They um, create a society that is dependent and they prevent citizens from having the will to create, to have children, to grow, and to actually um, trust in the better future. They are afraid, citizens are afraid, and this uh, uh, culture disappears. And we don't want this to happen. We uh, don't want to have a uh, society um, the way uh, society is actually materializing in certain points of the world. In a nutshell, the popular uh, party in Madrid had a very uh, good result during the last election. And from uh, right to uh, left, we uh, call on all the members of society with uh, uh, been given a majority. Uh, we will now have uh, a majority as a result of these elections. And uh, in our case, we uh, want to uh, win the national elections uh, next December. Uh, we cannot be uh, in the worst news. Uh, stop condemning uh, what happens, for instance, with public funding. The um, issues that th that have been voiced by the uh, news. We don't want this to happen. It is going to be a difficult year for Spain, um, but life is not easy. Uh, and if it is easy, it's probably because we are not living it the way we should be living it. Thank you very much. President, thank you very much for sharing your, your experience with us, for sharing your thoughts, which are very useful for, for colleagues in Portugal and for mayors from other corners of, of Europe. We wish you, of course, best of luck for the elections on the 28th of May. And we are convinced that the more local and regional leaders Partido Popular will have in Spain, the more opportunities for people, for enterprises in Spain, for development, for growth, and the better it will also be for Portugal and for relations between Portugal and Spain. So good luck for you for the elections. Uh, on that note, we are moving to the second panel. Let me just introduce the colleagues of the second panel. Title of the panel, Enhancing Synergies Between the Recovery Funds and the Traditional EU Funds. Key to a speedy recovery and resilience. And I invite up here, Olga Gablevich, the President of the EPP Group in the Committee of the Regions and President of West Pomerania Region in Poland. <laughs> Olgierd will lead and moderate this panel. Kostas Bakoyanis, the Mayor of Athens. <laughs> Marku Markula, the President of the Helsinki Region and former President of the, uh, of the Committee of Regions. Eduardo Oliveira Esocha, the, the President of the Confederation of Portuguese Farmers. Fra as you wish. Francesco Caleros, the President of the Confederation of Portuguese Tourism. And Vasco Ferraz, the uh, Mayor of uh, Ponte Lima. Thank you. Olga Gablevich, you have the floor, please. Okay, dear friends, before we start, I would like to right now invite our dear uh, friend, uh, very experienced MEP and well-known friend, Paolo Rangel, the Vice President of the EPP Group, to opening remarks. Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, my 
friend Olgir Geblevich. And uh, naturally, I'd like to uh, welcome all of you, and especially uh, the president of PSD, Luis Montenegro, and of CDS, Nuno Melo. Uh, let me only have a first remark, and then I will turn to Portuguese, and I'll be very, very brief. But the first remark, to thank uh, very, very much to Siegfried Muresan, Jan Olbricht, and José Manuel Fernandes because they organized with uh, their own heart and commitment this session. And it is something that probably is not noted, but it's not easy to have here today in our panel the president of Madrid community, Isabel Diaz Ayuso, that is probably one of the most uh, I'd say, inspirational politicians of EPP and of Europe. And uh, uh, she knows that in Portugal she is very well known and she's a reference for all of us. Then also Rafal Traskovsky, the mayor of Warsaw, that is a very, very good and old friend and that is also a prominent uh, politician in Europe and in Poland. I remember that he was a candidate to be president of the republic, and he lost by a very, very, very small margin. Then to have here Kostas Pakoyanis, the mayor of Athens, and that I'm sure that will uh, uh, give to the Portuguese government a very, very useful lesson, because Greece is making a tremendous job in this coordination between normal European funds and next generation EU and also to Marco Marcula, the president of Helsinki region. So to have these, uh, 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 I'd say, four stars, together with Carlos Moedas, Ricardo Rio, and the other mayors here, this is a panel of excellence. And EPP is really the driving force of Europe. And here we know that EPP wants to be close to the people at local and regional level, and with that to change our own country. So thank you very much. It was really great that the three of you, that I would say the Mr. Budget, the three Mr. Budget of uh, EPP group and of European Parliament were really capable of doing this in our capital in Lisbon. So thank you very much. This being said, I'll be very brief and I will turn to Portuguese. Uh, 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 only to give you three main, uh, uh, I'd say, points for uh, discussion, debate, reflection. The first one concerning today's uh, topic that I'd like to emphasize is that in the Portuguese case, and this is a flaw of the socialist government, there is no coordination between the RRP and the cohesion funds and that is it's nonsense and uh, it's kind of a waste when the country has a financial uh, support framework for 2026 2030 and is not capable is incapable to coordinate link these two frameworks and i th believe that this point is a negative one for portugal because of an error of planning by the socialist government. Second of all, our RRP, next generation EU, is fully geared towards current expenditure, not geared towards recovery and resilience. It's geared towards paying daily costs. Just to give you an example, to um, fix the uh, tiles of the museum, contemporary museum of Shadow, Sh is a uh, eight represents eight point eight million to um, recover this building, but it's not recovering the economy. Second point: the Court of Auditors also uh, has already prepared a report saying that monitoring, control, evaluation of expenses 
within the RPP hasn't been duly guaranteed in Portugal. And that is why we have an enormous volume of funding. The but how this spending is carried out does not exist. Finally, is I would like to say the following, and I'm going to conclude. That is the RRP and the cohesion funds are a great opportunity for a country like Portugal, maybe the all, the last opportunity to move forward in development, to make one more step. But since the government is consumed, that is tr treating its internal wound, there is no space for it to think about the future not even any room, even with a worse RRP, to be able to use what can be used. And there is no room nor space to think about the cohesion fund and by 2030. So at this moment, we are wasting our opportunity while the internal battles within the Socialist Party is seen um, by all. And within the government, it's a factor that which is harming the launching of that opportunity. Maybe things might change regarding the RRP, but the final deadline is 2026. And so time is of essence. And again, wishing you a very productive discussion. And also I'd like to think, say the following to our social partners. When you are invited by when you were invited by this panel to be to take part, all said yes right away. It means that civil the Portuguese civil society from agriculture, tourism, enterprises is fully even from the social sector is fully on board, fully committed, so that the RRP and European funds be an opportunity, not which is not lost but used. Thank you very much. Much Paolo. Yeah. And to right now, dear friends, because before we start, I would like to firstly, uh, on behalf of the EPP group uh, in the uh, Com European Committee of Regions, I would like to uh, firstly thank you very much, very cordially, uh, as the president of uh, EPP and SUR, to Siegfried Muresian for actually inviting this format to meeting together between European politicians and local politicians. We, are, we, s we have started uh, last year in Warsaw uh, together with Rafał Trzaskowski. Right now we are here in Lisbon, thanks to hospitality, for Portuguese for hospitality. And I think that it is something uh, really what we can even more develop. And uh, thanks to uh, this, we can only deliver, deliver on the ground uh, thanks to the better co communication with, uh, with Brussels, with Europe. So thank you, thank you personally, and thank you on behalf of all uh, local and regional uh, friends. Then, of course, I would like to thanks to our uh, guests, uh, uh, to our hosts, I'm sorry, and to, uh, on behalf of guests. <laughs> and uh, first of all, unfortunately, he's, uh, he had to leave, uh, but of course, uh, Carlos Moedas for organizing everything. But of, of course, we are more than happy that we have both leaders of our APP affiliated parties, uh, the Nuno Melo. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm very uh, happy that uh, that uh, Luis Montenegro joined us. And uh, I I was following uh, the recent polls in 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 uh, poli Portuguese uh, political scene, and I realize that right now you are leader of a biggest, strongest party. So thank you for your strong commitment and for your strong uh, uh, leadership, and it is very very promising. So uh, Luis, once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Why I think that uh, our meetings are so important? You know th that uh, as a local and regional authorities, we are uh, we are implementing something like 90 percent of whole investments in Europe. Uh, I have a lot, plenty of uh, examples from my country, from my region. Fr in Poland, uh, presidents of regions have a. Uh, really huge power because we are managing authorities in uh, European funds. Uh, so I, as I've been for uh, 12 years, 
I'm uh, the president of a region. I have a lot of experience on the ground. But uh, I know that my colleagues have the, the, their own experience from all corners of Europe and uh, it will be a great opportunity to share how we can change our reality on the ground. And what I would uh, at the very first moment uh, only add is that, you know, it is some kind of difference between uh, even language we use uh, in comparison with a socialist. Uh, because socialists usually are talking about spending European money. And in EPP, we are talking about investing European money. In the investing for a people, investing in the people, for, for example, just like in European social funds, and investing with the people, because we are talking about the people, uh, what you, in which field we should really invest. And it is something what differ us. Today, during a panel, we will discuss how uh, make this investment even stronger. Thank you, thanks to the synergy between traditional funds and RRF. As you surely know, I don't have uh, nothing to add because Rafał told that in Poland, uh, RRF is completely blocked, so we don't have any experience on that, how to build a synergy. Uh, so that's why, uh, firstly, I would like to uh, invite our uh, good friend, Kostas Bakoyanis, mayor of Athens and member of our political group in the Committee of Regions uh, to share their, uh, his experience. Uh, I think that I know uh, that uh, in Greece we have our government, so we have much better experience than, for example, in Poland that or in Portugal. Kostas, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon. It's wonderful to be back in beautiful Lisbon. Say that it's my first time back since 2020, I think, and one can sense a change in the air. One can sense a newly found sense of confidence and dynamism. And kudos to our good friend uh, Carlos for making this possible. He is a source of optimism for all of us mayors all around the world. And of course, my sincere thanks to the PPE for bringing us all together. I think moments are like these are quite important because we have the opportunity to get together and learn from each other. Together we are stronger. That's something that's very, very clear for us, from the north to the south or from the west to the east of Europe. Now, this is actually um, a major political topic. So if I may, I'd like to get some distance and think about how in a few years we're going to draw our conclusions about what we're doing. So in a sense, it is about European integration. It is about strengthening and enriching our democracy. It's also about Europe's place in the world. Let's say that uh, at the time of crisis, uh, Europe acted relatively fast, and yes, a major step was taken towards European integration. I think we can all be very proud of that. However, when we go to the second criterion, strengthening our democracies and enriching our democracies and actually bringing our citizens closer to European institutions, or to put it differently, and uh, quote uh, a headline from Politico this morning, making sure that we send a message that we don't live in our glass houses, which is uh, our party's agenda, I think there is much more to be desired. Because the truth is that in planning uh, the fund, civil society, social partners, the private sector, and local government were completely excluded. Now, the third criterion, being Europe's place in the world, I'm afraid, my friends, this is where it gets a bit depressing. Uh, many of us uh, who are in touch with our colleagues and our counterparts from on the other side of the Atlantic, mayors and governors on a city and state level in the United States, have a very different picture. How much money uh, the Congress, despite the US Congress, despite being deadlocked and toxic and partisan, has been able to channel to the cities and to the states, and how quickly they've been able to take advantage of this money. Uh, the mayor of New York, uh, New York being a city that has almost the population of Greece and almost the population of Portugal, was telling me just before Christmas that they have already made use of, of all their COVID money. All of the funds have actually reached their natural beneficiaries. 
So why am I saying this? Not to whine or to complain, I don't think that's the point. I'm saying is because we need to draw lessons if we want to move forward on a national and a European level. Now, I'm proud to report that in the case of Greece, things are different. As you know, we have a member government which despite uh, moving very, very quickly and very, very efficiently, very quickly involved social partners, local government and civil society, academic institutions in the process. Deliberation over WhatsApp, nevertheless, deliberation. Because we do live at a time of networks and not at a time of hierarchies. As a result, right now, if you look at our numbers, you see that Greece has, uh, in a very, I'd say, un-Greek way, being able uh, to, to make very good use of the funds quickly and positively, do this with maximum transparency, and at the same may make sure that, as you said, that it's not just about spending the money, it's about investing the money. Which is what we're doing in the city of Athens as well. Right now, the city of Athens has the biggest budget it ever had it's in, in its history, and at the same time has been able to cut city taxes considerably. Right now, we're moving forward with the biggest public investment program in the history of our city. And yes, we have three axes. Number one is our digital transition. 100% of our city services are already digital. Number two is building towards a green city. Everything and anything we do is from something very small to something very big has a response to the climate crisis at its heart. And number C, it's about building a fair and inclusive city. So this is our moment and we are optimistic, but we fully appreciate, as our colleague from Madrid said before, that it's going to be a difficult climb and it's going to be a long climb. However, so I, that I can end, much like I started, I very much believe that when we are all together and when we draw strength from each other, we can all be much better and at the end of the day, serve our people much better. Once again, many, many thanks for the kind invitation. Well, thank you, Kostas, um, for sharing this optimistic information right now, because, you know, uh, till now it was very, very, we had a lot of uh, uh, pessimistic uh, experiences. Uh, right now I would like to go to Marku Markula, to president of Helsinki region, member of our group, former uh, president of the Committee of Regions, uh, asking uh, uh, Marku how to build the synergy uh, when we have uh, what was, what have been said, different philosophy in these two two instruments, projects, uh, contra reforms. On the other hand, different timing, and on the other hand, uh, not clear demarcation as well. So, how to do it really, really efficient? How to, how you can do it in Finland? Okay, uh, thank you, Olgier. And I had thought that I have three kind of ways to have this short intervention, and luckily that <laughs> you kind of picked up one of those. So, uh, and uh, what we just heard Costas to talk about. So, I will take a bit different angle and especially focus on how to make this transformation, positive transformation, what Carlos Moedas was describing, that uh, he has challenged uh, his staff and the whole Lisbon and Portugal to make. So how can we make that uh, fast so that it, it serves the citizens, it supports the citizens, and especially the well-being and interests of citizens. So, so let's take, and I think that the, the key word here is, is innovation. Why now, especially after the Mr. Putin's illegal attack? So we in, in the EU, we are more united than ever. So that we need stronger EU and we need to uh, have a clear targeted efforts, but we need this uh, transformation to be more open-minded uh, Europe based on our European democratic value on, on which the EPP is to, uh, uh, not just a strong believer, but we are the base for that. And what does that mean? Let me first take the example of Finland, because we are the EU country has faced tens of years uh, the, the Russian neighborhood. We tried to take that positively, be good friends, but still seeing that 
the system that the uh, Soviet Union and Russia have had, so that's not what we want to happen in Finland. We have 1,300 kilometers border, land border, border with Russia, so we are one of the best equipped military uh, nation in Finland. And to have you as well, especially Portuguese, so uh, an understanding, Finland is actually, we are a big country or small country, depends on how you measure. Our number of inhabitants is half of uh, Portugal. We are a bit more than five million only, but our size, that's uh, close to four times more. So we are one of the largest by area in, in the EU, and then this border with Russia. So now uh, the citizens after the 24th of February last year, citizens started to request that we need now finally make the decision and enter NATO to have a stronger EU by the help of that. And then after a couple of weeks, uh, our EPP uh, or the president of the Republic who is e uh, former EPP leaders, uh, Saulinis made a clear approach that it's time to move on and th then the uh, socialist-led government started to support that and then we looked uh, to Sweden, so okay, let's join. We two strong Nordic countries, we need to come to NATO. And that means as well so that the, the EU is more relevant than ever to move on. But now then to what we can create for this, what is our recovery topic uh, uh, and the interest on that. So it means as well that the role of innovation uh, needs to be kind of upgraded more and more uh, uh, Madam Carvalho, we have worked a lot in the past years when I was the president with the parliament. So how we can accelerate, get the people and political decision maker, makers understand. It's the human capital. It's intellectual capital, which was uh, for years and years strong actually in, in Poland as well. I have a lot of good professors, friends there, who have said so much about this uh, human capital and how to invest that. And what does this upgrade uh, the role of innovation mean? So uh, one of our uh, strong commissioners, Maria Gabriel, introduced in, in July the new European innovation agenda. And we are the strong believers on that by the Committee of the Region. Uh, Maria Gabriel was in, in Finland in a big uh, uh, student and startup event uh, slash. So in November, so we introduced as the first EU country with our region, we quickly made a, a special kind of implementation plan. What does it to me, to me mean to be a forerunner in implementing the European Union innovation agenda? And this shows on some of these uh, key highlights. And actually, I think that it's just to fair that our key five messages, so, so first there is that uh, influencing the climate change. We, the region, will be carbon neutral. Can you guess what is the year? 2030, the whole Helsinki region, which is a huge area as well, close to two million people, we will be carbon neutral and not just want, we will be 2030. We have a detailed roadmap to move with the private industry, with all the investors, with municipalities, city leaders, mayors on that. Second is that we want to showcase how to reach these ambitious EU targets in the innovation agenda by working together locally and uh, European wide. We have organized together with the EU Joint Research Center a special science meets regions as a process last year and uh, to move more to the evidence based policy making to get results to the citizens and to our industry as well. Everyone needs to be on board. Fourth was that we mobilize extensive regional collaboration to increase our research and development investments. Uh, together, public and private, we have a clear target for 2030 to be above 5% of the GDP to R&D. Europe wants to reach a 3% level and so on. So again, so that we have realized that that's the only way for a small country located that far in the north to, to be a prominent uh, player in the global market. And the fourth... Uh, uh, fifth point for us was to, to this forerunner. That means that we need more partnerships with you. With the we just had a meeting with the 
uh, Isabel Dia Ayoso so on about what we can do together with uh, Madrid and Helsinki and both have started already a lot on the practical level. So these kind of things are the ones that recovery funds should be targeted to with the cohesion funds but we have certain mainly national regulations uh, slowing down this development. It's not a really strat that we can easily strategically focus on what the local uh, municipalities, cities want, what is defined there politically in the strategies of the cities. And that should be more that EU gets more, we can get uh, more, most of this progress by having this, making that happen, what Carlos Moedas uh, told in his opening statement, the examples of this flooding, how to tackle those the tunnel pipelines, and so, or, so that the adaptation is a crucial, or how he uh, introduced that, that what has been done under his leadership for the Lisbon to be really attracting unicorn developments to from startups to uh, scale up growth companies and so this is what we need everywhere in Europe and that's one of the core in this Maria Gabriel's innovation agenda so we need to beat United States we need to beat China because we have the stronger belief and we have the better individual mindset resources here we can get the political support stronger for, for that. So, and uh, what does this mean? So just to conclude, so that, uh, that uh, in using the recovery funds, and uh, so the first kind of starting point, prerequisite and requirement is that local and regional stakeholders, including then uh, companies, enterprises, knowledge institutions, citizens, local authorities, we need to be leading this uh, in a meaningful way and second is so that uh, this transformative uh, policy needs to be a very much system level. So it's all forms of innovation, especially societal innovations, open-minded, led by the politicians, where we use the latest technology. We invest more on uh, research of the new technology so that we can combine the results of what we've already heard and what we hear when we have the experts of digitalization from companies and get the industry as in our case. So industry is a strong, let's say, driver for this transformation, investing and taking a global responsibility on, on all of this. And so it's, it's really strongly place-based development and targeted uh, for better Europe and, and uh, on that so we can do a lot more in the partnership between regions and cities all across. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, uh, uh, remind us uh, that uh, that RRF money are not only money for a government or for uh, cities and regions, but it is uh, uh, also money for a private sector. And uh, right now, I would like to. Uh, that's why I give a floor to our speakers who will represent private sector. Uh, firstly, uh, Eduardo Oliveira uh, Sousa, president of the Confederation of Portuguese Farmers. I hope that speak a little bit how to use, uh, how we can use this RF money to transform our agriculture and our rural areas as well. So please, the floor is yours. I know that you would like to intervene from lecture, so please, the lecture is yours. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for allowing me speaking here. And once we have uh, immediate translation, I will speak in Portugal. In Portugal. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ex-president uh, of PSD, Luís Montenegro, uh, Euro Parliamentary, Ms. Muito, uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, José Manuel Fernández Anun Mel, which I do not see in the room, and also greet Paul Rangel and other members of the panel. I would like to thank you for giving me these few minutes. Our colleague, our colleague, is also president of a farmers uh, association, and uh, Firmelinda also part 
of this association unfortunately cannot participate. And since this panel is on enhancing synergies between the recovery funds and then traditional funds, such as Portugal 2030 and the Common Agricultural Policy in the Portuguese case, PEPAC, since we consider that the RPP's plan should have been the subject of a wider discussion, more comprehensive understanding the different uh, community funding instruments, this did not uh, happen. In terms of RPP, a strategy is not recognized for the country, and the program is a mechanism of financial re strengthening to for carrying out public investment that in the last years the government was not able to promote with its own resources, that is the RPP, was a type of lottery that uh, the government uh, won. And that's why the way with the state, uh, it's not under that it's been in detriment of expenses, as was mentioned, their investment for companies because companies need to grow if they want indeed to be resilient and if they want to recover the country. That's why it's called the RRP. Uh, agriculture is an example, a paradigm example of the absence of strategies for the countries mirrored in this plan. And if uh, uh, Professor Antonia Corsacil's division identified agriculture as an essential sector in Portugal's recovery. The fact is that the RRP ignored this thought. Agriculture is a structuring activity uh, in the vast territory, and its development represents an important contribution for the national um, economy deserving recognition and sustainable development and even of a, of a thrust. However, agriculture is not included in the country's discussion political, political options, maybe because of prejudgments of not being able to understand its real importance and because it's a sector with its own policy, which is the common agricultural policy. Uh, whatever the motivation, it's wrong, but agriculture cannot um, uh, not be just stuck to the common agricultural policy. The rural world needs more, and this political agricultural policy uh, tries to provide different responses, but it f it's faced with other challenges which are cross-cutting to the different sectors of this activity where the RRP's response would be essential. And also, identifying a flaw in the future's vision and a strategy to achieve it. For instance, due to climate change, fighting a uh, water shortage should be a national plan, mobilizing the entire society. It's not just uh, something claimed by the sector. For instance, when we when we were aware, as was mentioned by José Manuel Fernández, when we were aware that the RRP, when 0.6 million were added to Portugal. We immediately proposed to the government that, that this 1.634 6, million be dedicated, allocated to reinforcing water storage to fight droughts. And what is even, it wasn't even discussed, nor words uh, were mentioned. The access to high tech uh, technology, digitalization, knowledge, these are. Uh, important needs of a modern agriculture. So it's very important to have um, broadband uh, internet coverage. Once again, RAP could be used to take 5Gs to the entire territory, not as it was done to only 80% of the population. As we know that in Portugal um, is located, uh, but it's it will only be productive if accompanied by a, a, an organization's restructuring. What's ha what, what is happening now? It's just scanning documents, not really digitalizing. The government does not only adopt the necessary funds for investment, nor does it create a context where the state is an enabler of investment for these companies. The government, for the government, it seems that growth 
could be done in the absence of companies. For instance, regarding the forts, we need to change the state's apparatus so that the RFP's intervention can happen and bear its fruit. In energy transition, intervention of different funds in the agricultural sectors have been limited and is based on the lack of knowledge regarding energy consumption. Energy consumption in uh, agriculture has its own form. Portugal needs more industry and also agriculture-based uh, uh, industry with a solid uh, technical component based on um, distribution, uh, especially those regions which have been threatened by um, by the the absence of uh, leaving of population, the absence of the border between the border between Spain and Portugal should uh, be an attraction in terms of proximity with larger markets. Internal enhancement and uh, as well as external are fundamental. The RRP could encourage promote the them, but after having said so. There's only one measure which has been a specific measure dedicated to the RRP, which is Terre Futura, Future Land, imagined by the Ministry of Agriculture with 40 percent of uh, the sums have been allocated to recovering absolute uh, houses, building a heritage of the state which is in ruin. In ruins, it's important to uh, contradict the public aspect of the RRP and also to contradict the urban perspective of the of Portugal funds 2030 and consider the rural uh, regions in terms of the operationalization of these plans we need to involve the economic agents represented by the different confederation we're concerned with the aromatic uh, functioning of the RRP the it's low execution low implementation um, that is 9% and in the end, we're going to look back and see a country without identifying relevant changes for the our economic social fabric. And if after this RRP, we, if we're able, um, not if Romania uh, surpasses us, there will then be something um, wrong. This plan, this is something that I'm cannot really accept. Thank, thank you very much. Came back to some pessimistic uh, opinions. <laughs> uh, so right now, uh, right now, as you surely know, we all surely know, the one of the most affected uh, branches during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, was the tourism. Uh, I know because my region is uh, one of the the most popular tourist destination in Poland. Uh, so I know that how affected this branch was, and actually, uh, for such a uh, branches, uh, recover and resilience uh, found was invented. So I would like to right now ask our next speaker, Francesco Colheiros, uh, president of the Confederation of Portuguese Tourism, uh, how it is in Portugal, how this money are used to. Uh, fight with uh, with consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I also will speak in Portuguese, if you don't mind. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I would like to greet uh, Mr. Uh, Luis Montenegro and Nudmel, the uh, presidents of PSD and CDSPP and uh, also Mr. Rangel and José Manel and all members of e the European Parliament. I prepared a speech to actually uh, give you an idea of what uh, happens. But before I read it, I would like to uh, answer to your question more precisely. When the RRF was discussed, we started to uh, discuss also with our government so as to add a chapter on tourism to the RF. At the time, we were explained that uh, 
uh, that was not possible because the uh, RRF in our country and also for other countries would not mention specific activities and this would be raised in the future plans. So we were careful enough to study uh, the um, RRF both in Spain and in Italy and in either of uh, these uh, plans we have a specific chapter for tourism. And it was not also true that we did not uh, uh, had a special mention to uh, other activities because it included uh, two activities that uh, can, in fact, that are important, and those are culture and sea. But I don't know whether they will um, be able to do actually uh, make us uh, thrive uh, with regards to our economy. We still feel the effects of COVID-19, and now we have the consequences of war. And it is within this context that companies have shown resilience. They have emerged even stronger and uh, attentive to challenges and the opportunities of new trends and the in the market, namely digital transition and the digital digitization. Now uh, aware of the uh, importance of adapting tourism to technological changes, um, companies in the area of tourism know that they have an essential role in supporting uh, a sustained recovery. In order to make this a reality, we need to respond to new behaviors and to the new longers of consumers and meet their future expectations. This is why we need to design products and uh, uh, tourism services that are more relevant and designed to meet the needs of uh, travelers. This means that companies need to be economically sound to uh, make the required investments. And after two years of a pandemic, um, is something that does not happen. And as you said in your presentation, this is most likely the sector that has been most affected by COVID. The RRF uh, um, is a key instrument to capitalize companies. And at the same time, it is uh, a support to uh, the response to green uh, transition. It will stimulate tourism activity and it will help to achieve the objectives of sustainability until 2027. And we uh, want to improve tourism, namely with an investment 151 million euro in areas such as digitization and climate change. Via these uh, support uh, programs, we want to promote recovery and uh, tourism companies will also always be available for this. However, in Portugal, uh, support uh, has not been getting to company as they are blocked by bureaucracy, starting with the applications uh, to these very same programs. Companies are highly resilient, uh, otherwise we would be uh, even more delayed in terms of our recovery post-COVID. Tourism has been the shelter and the uh, engine for the Portuguese economy. Until November last year, and according to data from the Bank of Portugal, uh, revenue reached uh, 18 billion euro, and the estimates is that total revenue from tourism last year will be over 20 billion euro. I would like also to mention the importance of support tourism in the uh, archipelagos of uh, both Madeira and the Azores. Looking ahead and looking into the sustainable development of uh, tourism, we see that there are factors that continue to be essential and progress has needs to be made. The new airport uh, in the region of Lisbon, and uh, we uh, do expect that the independent committee um, meets the deadlines that have been defined and that until the end of the year, we um, choose the new location, the location of the new airport. Besides the required infrastructures, we need to have strong companies. And this is why it is very important that financial support to company capitalization um, really happens. The agreement on productivity and income needs to be a practical reality, and the government needs to come forward with a reduction of the tax load so that companies have better conditions to continue uh, to go back to investment and create jobs. Uh, of course, we uh, need to um, prevent 
inflation from, from uh, uh, peaking. The tourism activity will continue on its way to recovery. It will continue to be the uh, drive for economic uh, recovery. Entrepreneurs uh, in the field of tourism will try to respond to the new trends and to the needs of consumers. I believe that with more or less difficulties, tourism will be always on the path of growth. We will not. Um, we will continue until we um, win. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And right now. Uh, we are coming back to, to our uh, cities and to uh, local, uh, this local dimension. I would like to right now uh, give a floor to Vasco, to Vasco Ferraz, mayor of Ponte Lima, uh, to share their uh, perspectives and experiences, uh, if it is possible uh, in your city to uh, build a synergy between uh, this recovery resilience funds and uh, traditional EU money, how it, how it works on the ground. So good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, greet uh, the president of CDS, PSD, and also the Euro um, parliamentarians, uh, colleagues, and also greet all those present in mass media and allow me if I may, to speak in Portuguese, to uh, continue with our identity. And also, it's a way of uh, doing much better. And why? And this uh, topic is a very delicate one. I'm taking advantage of the invitation given to the uh, City Hall of Pont Lima. We're very different from other uh, realities that were mentioned here in terms of municipal management, speaking about larger uh, Portuguese, larger cities as well as in the EU. And we're part of the small, medium-sized uh, municipalities, uh, city halls of the country. And realities are very different from the ones that we've heard spoken about. And at the same time, I'd like to congratulate the EPP for having invited us to take part in this conference. Because in a three-hour session, EPP will be listening more to the Portuguese local authorities in terms of distribution, programming of the uh, RP for Portugal than uh, um, the government has heard us. So it's heard us longer than the government has listened to us. And if there is uh, something um, that we should be proud of, if it's of always being, it's always being in the forefront or at the back in relation to the protection policy of our population. During the pandemic, uh, the municipalities were the main drivers safeguarding our population. Uh, with our um, funds, municipal budgets, we created screening centers, we created vaccination centers, we also created the field hospitals, and only after, and then we created the first uh, restrictions to our populations, we, even with the political burden in a period that could be compared at the time without knowing this pre electoral period because f during two years, not much was done to um, to show what um, um, the local authorities were done. And then information was requested on what the city halls were doing to provide information to the Portuguese uh, government so it could legislate. We know what are the real needs. We know the real needs. Uh, of our society at different levels with everything that uh, differentiates us within the territory because we're a territory with very big diversity, both in, in uh, cultural gastronomy and experience. It was a pity that not everyone was heard. In our case, uh, Pont Lima, we deal quite well. We're coping uh, with, uh, we're dealing with the RP funding because we were visionary in relation to what we're doing. We're um, making investments that would be n normal, investing 
um, capital with uh, hidden with uh, certain numbers, carrying out uh, urban regeneration. Re about 360 having to do with accessibility it's urban generation all uh, mayors are concerned with accessibility and they um, try to do what they can also investing in culture and since we're part of the theater uh, cinema network in terms of audiovisuals we are also making investments in housing accommodation, but if we had to focus on what is housing in Portugal today, even what can be the RRP support, we would have to, we would then have a debate that would not last two or three hours, but would last almost three months, which is a very big problem the country faces. We're not just creating one thing, it's not only resilient, nor um, um, f no, uh, what we're creating is a greater burden for the municipalities that feel um, superseded. And uh, years from now, we'll have more heritage to maintain and without having access to any type of community funding. In our specific case, we um, did a step forward. We did not increase social we didn't only increase social housing but we're carrying out intervention in social housing for that uh, ref refurbish one step uh, that is one step out of house many municipalities need social housing creating more social uh, housing so in a certain way uh, we're um, giving another um, path to our citizens uh, these lines, what we should do is that the Euro parliamentaries, uh, EEP, and others should tell our government, please listen to your communities, listen to your municipalities, to your businessmen, create your own, create projects. These projects, there are projects that lack, that are lacking. But in different dimension, this should be uh, told to the government in the best interest of the regions. The country is better governed when we listen to people, listen to our local authorities. And to conclude, let me say that it was a pleasure to be able to speak before you. I wouldn't have been able to do so in such an easy way that is as um, um, member of the CDS, it's a pleasure to be able to help the party, help the country. And if my, and if what I've just said means that we can move forward, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a strong, strong voice. As I mentioned in the very beginning, you, uh, we as a EPP, invest uh, our common money, our European money uh, in the, for a people, in a people, and with a people. Uh, so I uh, hope that it is, this event it is a proof that we would like to be in a constant uh, discussion about how to invest this money with the local uh, leaders, with the local authorities, and with the local societies. Uh, and it is the the, the the main difference so i hope that maybe uh, maybe portuguese government will hear uh, us from this event and it will be the strong message take us as a people on board because you can change the world with other people uh, so it is the the key issue right now i would like to open the floor to uh, to all of you if you have any questions to our distinguished guests uh, and i see right now uh, our uh, our special guest, uh, MEP, Maria de Carvalho, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I don't know who can deliver the mic. Okay. Thank you very much. It's more a comment than a, a, a question. It's a comment that uh, there is 
as Paul Rangel has said, no coordination between the Recovery and Resilience Plan and the regional funds. But there is also no coordination, especially in Portugal, between these funds and the innovation funds that uh, Mark Marcula said that is so important. So these funds are uh, managed uh, in Brussels. Uh, for example, the Horizon Europe, but also the Digital Europe. In the Horizon Europe, we have uh, 30 billion euros for partnerships between the industry and the enterprise and research and universities that target the emerging technologies, bio, new materials, data, uh, to apply all that in industry and enterprises. And uh, I was a rapporteur of that part of Horizon Europe, and we have introduced in the regulation the possibility to do synergies between the, uh, these innovation funds and the recovery and resilience plan. So you can develop the technology financed by Brussels directly in a, in a network with universities and research centers and enterprises, and after the pilot scale, the demonstration to do it through the recovery or the, uh, the regional funds. This possibility that is so important for our enterprises to do the transformation, as Antoine Saraiva has said today, not, is not enough to re recover the industry. It's important to transform the industry and the enterprise. So important all over Europe, but especially in Portugal, we are not using these uh, possibilities. So is one comment, and uh, I would like that the government also listen to, to that and put that in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this comment and for another strong message to uh, Portuguese government. Uh, if somebody would like to intervene, Marco. Marco. Um, thank you. I, I just want to add to that because a lot of this slow motion kind of movie in innovation, it happens to you that, uh, that the EU Horizon Research enormous good financing, but it's uh, targeted for something very specialized research, and, and it's always practically kind of uh, not that straightforward at all serving the local level transformation. And of course, uh, it could, we could even uh, talk now with uh, Maria Gabriel and the others, their director general, so, so that if we take just uh, uh, take Madrid region, what we heard uh, uh, Isabel Ayoso saying here. So I, I know I've talked a lot with them and a lot of our Helsinki region people collaborate in concrete research with them. If we take Madrid, Lisbon, Helsinki, maybe one or two others who are very advanced in making these breakthrough innovations for societal transformation and write it down clearly that we have a proposal how to make this transformation in an accelerated speed to happen. And that could be then financed through the horizon. It meets with the criteria, but if we have only the academic experts separately reviewing each of these big pro projects, so then they will not serve what Europe needs at the moment. Some can be used, some money can be used on that uh, kind of academic best expert research, but some needs to be targeted for this transformation as well. Thank you, for ah, thank, you. thank you, Marco. And uh, as I don't see any comments from your side, I would like to thank you. Thank you for all our guests. Thank you. Uh, uh, Costas, thank you, Marco, uh, thank our president, uh, Mr. Sosa, Mr. Carjeros, uh, uh, and Mr. Ah, sorry, because I'm not good. You know, Polish uh, sounds quite similar, but it is completely different, uh, different still language. And of course, Mayor Ferras, uh, thank you very much. And I, right now, I would like to give the lecture, not the floor, to Siegfried Murishan to closing remarks. Thank you. Look, th thank you very much. Just to say that we have heard this morning what the vision of the EPP, of our mayors, of our local regional elected leaders for the implementation of next generation EU is. We want this to be implemented in a transparent way. We want this to be implemented based on the priorities of the people with a strong involvement of local regional leaders. We know time is short. We know the law now says that money has to flow until 2026, 
this is why speed is important, this is why cooperation is important, and this is also what governments have to understand. Particularly the socialist governments of Portugal and Spain, they have to understand that these are not money that they can use based on their political preferences, but these are money from Europe for the people of Portugal, for the people of Spain. It should be used based on their needs. We should finance projects which have no chance to be financed otherwise. We should create exactly the synergies that Maria Grassa was talking about. So finance projects that have no chance to be financed otherwise, but also finance projects which trigger more investments, which trigger private investments, so that we have synergies between next generation, cohesion funds, mm, private, private investments. Transparency is, uh, is important as well. This is the vision of the EPP, and for successfully implementing this in Portugal stand our two EPP member parties from here from Portugal, the Social Democratic Party, PSD, which is led by Luis Montenegro here with us, and our Christian Democratic People's Party, CDSPP, uh, led by Nuno Melo. They are both with us, and they will now deliver their keynote addresses. I think Nuno first, and then uh, Luis to conclude. Um, uh, to deliver his uh, important keynote speech. Nuno Melo, please, the floor is yours. My dear Siegfried Morizen, in you I want to welcome all the EPP. Meu caro Luís Montenegro, President do PSD. Dear uh, Luís Montenegro, President of the Social Democratic Party, partner and opponent, and this is life. Of all the European cities, and also obviously all the mayors from the CDS and uh, the PSD. If you don't mind, I, I will use the Portuguese, which is normal, and we have to talk also for the people over there. Can transmit, whom can transmit the, the proper message. So, going to the Portuguese. Muito a passar para o português. Yesterday, yesterday, colleagues from other countries that are participating at this conference were questioning um, the topic that was mentioned yesterday and that relating to Pope Francis coming to Portugal, I'm a Catholic. Uh, Europe has a lot of, or diff, have different beliefs. 80% of the Portuguese are Catholic, and again, I'm a Catholic. The problem had to do of, a, of a five million investment in an infrastructure used by the Pope in the youth journeys, which will bring to Portugal more than one million young people from all over the world, generating a lot more millions of revenue and since this infrastructure will be used later on in other initiatives. I would like to say that I'm not under, I'm not saying that this topic isn't important. Politics is also made up of such topic. I would wish that this infrastructure could be cheaper than what I've just said. Notwithstanding what I'd like to say to our colleagues from different countries is that Yesterday's news could have been others. There could have been other news. And sometimes, uh, and I would think even more significant, more meaningful. We could have been talking about 11 million euros spent in a web summit. You know what, it, what the web summit is. And not 5 million to welcome 71,000 visitors and not 1 million visitors during just a weekend and not six days as this will happen with Pope Francis coming to Portugal. Pope Francis is the Pope. He's not any other type of other reality. Or speak about 500,000 payment, one tenth of those five million at stake. Yesterday we could have spoken about um, paying uh, f 500 million, one tenth of that value of that infrastructure, paid just to one person, paid to one person because she was a, a director of uh, TAP, Portuguese public airline that has received 
since 2016, 3.2 billion euros of taxes from taxpayers, not 5 million, not 5 million, 3.2 billion euros from the different taxpayers, from our taxpayers. The problem it seems to be the cost of that infrastructure. Again, it's. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be as such, but what should have been on the news yesterday and today and tomorrow? What should be mentioned by the media outlet? What should really be the news that is after one third of the time to apply the RRP program in Portugal, RRP, only 9% of the 16 billion euros of these funds are absolutely strategic and decisive for Portugal were only executed not 5 million more than 16 billion out of which one third of the time only 9% were implemented in my country so this is this is true the socialists ill treat the economy, and it's not something they've been doing today. It's always been as such. Every time the socialists rule, the economy does not grow much, or the debt increases so that it becomes unsustainable. While I'm talking, the common agricultural policy represents the largest share of the EU budget. And while I'm talking, the socialist government has extinct the Secretary of State for Agriculture has, ex ex has removed that post. The Minister of the Agriculture in Portugal will that is will be together with the um, Secretary for Fisheries. Unbelievable. And so the Portuguese farmers would deserve a lot more. This fundamental sector of the Portuguese economy would deserve a lot more. The farmers in Portugal deserve an explanation. After having said this, recently, and speaking to the Minister of Cohesion, uh, Zemane, Luís Montgomery, and, 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 and Paul Rangel, of this weak socialist government, the President of the Republic, Professor Rubel Sosa, said he was paying attention to the execution of this plan, guaranteeing that he didn't want to see any flaws. And what I'd like to say to the President of the Republic is that there aren't many doubts about the disaster of how this plan was executed in terms of um, checking these different f flaws. On November the 11th, and this was all so said, on November 11th, the European Commissioner for um, the Economy, Paul Gentiloni, after seeing downwards uh, Portugal's growth for next year, has, has already said there's no openness to uh, negotiating the recovery uh, deadline. So at that pace, we will not be able to execute at 100% the more than 16 billion euros in the RRP. So, and if Anna, let me refer to the fact that this plan marked by socialist dogma wasn't very well designed for Portugal, and this was broached on by different mayors. Almost the entire funds of the RRP, almost its entirety is aimed at the public sector, and practically nothing for the private sector, in spite of the fact that in Portugal, it's the private sector that is the main driver in Portugal, it's the private sector, again, private sector that creates jobs, and it's the private sector that generates uh, wealth. It's not the state. State lives off the taxes charged to companies and to families. In spite of not being well designed, the RRP, and even 
the uh, small amounts for the private sector are e executed in very small amounts in Portugal. The Portuguese entrepreneurial association denounced that only 10 percent, and figures are very important when we're speaking about billions of euros, denounced that only 10 percent equivalent to 100,000 euros have reached the private sector. And applications um, were very uh, were being approved very late, and so the Portuguese Confederation for Construction alerted to the risks of tenders being deserted because a lot of time was wasted, a lot of time was wasted, and the costs were a mismatch. They suggested. It's a unique opportunity. It was a unique opportunity for Portugal. And to be able to understand the difference, to bear in mind what I'm saying, in Spain concerning the, uh, the regarding the España Puede, the neighboring country has received more than 45% of the amount, 69 billion euros, that was allocated to it. Comparing then to the 9% out of the 16 billion executed in Spain, comparing 40, 60%, 69 billion euros executed in Portugal. So comparing these figures after wasting the opportunity to design a capable program facing, being able to face the war economies, what did the socialist government do, the Portuguese socialist government? It kept the community funding incapable of executing and left to the private sectors, left them with the taxes to pay, while Portugal, and it's worthwhile to refer, has a, a CIT rate, which is quite high, one of the highest in OCDA. We're speaking about 38 countries in the OCDA. This rich country, as you can imagine, this rich benefits quite a lot of Europe, and but has the highest uh, uh, CIT rate because the uh, socialist uh, government think that the uh, Portuguese businessmen um, is have quite a lot more Thatcher said socialism is quite good until the, um, the other's money ends. There are no more socialists, no more competent socialists like the ones in Portugal, more is competent and experienced. So I'm going to conclude because I want to listen to Luis. I want to be very attentive uh, when uh, saying such neglect is so evident where uh, on how these funds are being executed in Portugal it's no uh, uh, no longer is at stake and I hope to know if it will pardon the government because this is unforgivable so president of the Republic and this is I'm addressing the president of the Republic in these words I have no doubt whatsoever in in this neglect of executing the, the RRP uh, joined to a political stability. Nine um, members replaced um, a different institutional criminal cases. Honestly, for us, in the C for us CDS, the time is to dissolve parliament with uh, elections in Portugal, and if it does happen, the CDS People's Party will be ready. Long live CDS, the um, PSD, and other parties, EPP parties. Well, good afternoon. Once again, welcome to all of you. It's a big pleasure to be here with you and uh, sharing uh, experiences and uh, perspective to the future. And uh, as you understand, like Nuno, I also will speak in Portuguese today. 
So, caras e caros. Dear friends, my dear Nuno, European uh, members of parliament, dear guests, first of all, I'd like to greet all of you that have uh, participated in this event an important event for us, uh, an event of sharing experiences, perspectives, you know, looking into the future, looking into common ways we uh, need to go forward uh, in the EU. I would like to thank especially to all the uh, people responsible in municipalities and uh, all stakeholders, uh, also to those that have come from uh, other countries in the EU and that have shared their perspectives and their opinions with us, and very specifically to, EPP, to the EPP and uh, thank the words that have been addressed to me and also to the members of the European Parliament, our members of Parliament, uh, Nuno Melo is here as the president of CDSPP and also a member of the European Parliament. He, uh, of course, will uh, not uh, complain if I uh, address very specially uh, all members of the PSD in the European Parliament and uh, Zemanov Fernandes. We've had uh, several events that value our participation within the e, uh, EPP and uh, within the European Parliament. We've uh, worked uh, with uh, our delegation uh, at the European Parliament, with our uh, members of the national parliament. We will have uh, also an event of uh, uh, this nature in Madeira after one that we've held in the Azores. We've been present in all initiatives of the European uh, Popular uh, Party. So this means that PSD wants to be an active voice in Europe and also uh, within our political family so that we uh, can in fact articulate policies that serve citizens, institutions, families and companies and then can actually show new uh, ways for progress and social justice. And this has to do with our vocation of actually contributing to the reinforcement, the strengthening of uh, uh, the capacity to intervene that we need to have at this European family. We are not leaders of the government in Portugal, but we will lead the government on the uh, uh, medium run. Let me just tell you that objectively, I was not going to speak about uh, this right now, but I was in the room when I heard uh, about this decision of the Portuguese government to ex actually to uh, extinguish the um, Secretary of State for Agriculture. So I have what one could uh, uh, call a mixed feeling, because this is on the one hand a demonstration of the devaluation, the lack of respect that the government uh, in Portugal has for this important sector of our economy, of our culture, and even our identity, which is agriculture. It is a lack of respect, a very important lack of respect. And I can't find any uh, parallel in the history of Portugal. Why do I say mixed feeling? Well, because uh, quite honestly, there is something new here, not exactly a surprise not only this lack of respect is uh, uh, goes together with many other examples, but also we know that today the Prime Minister has a lot of difficulty of recruiting quality politicians within uh, its, uh, his party, and uh, especially outside his party. This uh, difficulty, I don't know, 
uh, it may be associated to the fact that nobody uh, wanted to fill in, uh, you know, to respond to the th uh, 36 questions of that questionnaire that the Prime Minister wants to actually um, present to those uh, to the newcomers to the government, uh, but he refuses to apply that same questionnaire to the uh, current members of the government. Now this is bad news for Portugal and bad news for the Portuguese agriculture, uh, no doubt whatsoever on this. Uh, this is something that uh, materializes in added uh, difficulties in our day-to-day -day, uh, life, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, policies that serve agriculture and national production. At a time, and we've uh, seen several effects and several circumstances around the pandemic, and it was uh, during this uh, period that here in Portugal and all over Europe, we woke up to the need of having uh, better production factors and of actually not being as dependent as we've been during the last years. So it is precisely at a time where Europe and the country uh, have seen uh, this situation, have identified this situation. Uh, it is precisely at this uh, point in time where uh, focused on investing, that the uh, government disinvests uh, from the uh, reality uh, in the field of agriculture in this uh, country. Now, I believe that this conference that is targeted to the road to recovery, a road to recovery that is associated to common financing policies such that has uh, uh, never existed in, in Europe. Recovery and resilience is something that is uh, not usual in Europe. We're speaking about uh, financing facilities that are uh, common to all countries that are there to actually overcome the situation after the uh, pandemic. And they are the uh, highest expression of European solidarity that uh, is something that is seen with, with the cohesion funds, but uh, whereas cohesion funds are targeted to um, bridging the gap between uh, more developed to less developed, this uh, program, uh, RRF, is uh, overarching and we uh, should be having the same recovery experiences, gains and added uh, resilience all over Europe at the same uh, level and in the same way. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, this is a mistake that Europe is actually making regarding this uh, uh, financing facility, which is to uh, letting member, stra member states to actually uh, adopt strategies that do not serve or do not comply with the spirit, with the idea behind um, this uh, uh, recovery and resilience facility. Portugal is an example of this. What is it that has happened in Portugal during the last seven years? Well, we've had socialist governments We've had socialist governments that uh, uh, wanted to uh, fight against a uh, stigma that we had in Portugal regarding uh, unbalanced accounts, those that cannot or are not capable of managing what belongs to all of us without generating situations as traumatic as the ones that we've uh, had to live at the beginning of the last decade when we had the Troika here with us. Uh, uh, we had to borrow money from the EU and from the IMF. So during the last seven years, the socialist government decided to do away with this uh, stigma uh, that was overing its uh, policy and wanted to um, present uh, 
balanced public accounts. But one must say that balanced accounts of the socialist government are based especially on a uh, tax burden which is maximum. The taxes that Portuguese citizens and companies pay uh, nowadays have reached unprecedented levels. Minimum public investment. This means that public services have less and less um, ways of actually uh, serving or providing for the needs of people. And an economy that grows much less than the economies of cohesion countries. In Portugal, we had an accumulated, accumulated growth between uh, 16, uh, 2016 and 2021, and the situation has not uh, changed uh, despite of our growth. And the accum accumulated growth, since uh, we have socialists in the government, we've, uh, we grew less than half than uh, the average of the countries of European cohesion. And many countries grew uh, three or four fold. So what do these balanced accounts of the Socialist uh, Party mean? Uh, taxes, lack of growth, and this is what has happened in Portugal. And this has all to do with the RRF with uh, funding from Europe and it is because this Portuguese government has this management it postponed uh, essential uh, public investment and they have uh, used this to channel to all these financial uh, facilities that should be targeted to production, to investment, to businesses, and also to families. And both uh, companies and families are suffering from a high rate of inflation that uh, brings with it a uh, very high cost for the purchase of uh, essential um, items, we're speaking about food, um, and we're speaking about production uh, factors for companies that now have prices that uh, were not in the horizon. So this is why we feel it is a mistake to waste so much funding that lies you know in front of us that is our money that is your money the money of uh, the citizens of Europe and that money should be translated into a higher quality of life a higher production capacity more competitiveness uh, the creation of uh, added value the decision that was made is rather problematic because, as I said, we have about uh, 50 million euro between the 4 million of Portugal 2020, 18.2 billion of uh, the RRF, of the 16.2 uh, initial billion, we've had an increment of 1.6 billion euro. Uh, because we've had the worst performance of recovery in 2021 and we have yet another prerogative to help Portugal uh, come out or uh, leave this kind of situation. Uh, and now we have Portugal 23 as well. One needs to say very clearly that this is in fact a very important landmark in the life of our country. And why is that? 
because one of the things that we have is the absence of any structural transformation. There was no structural transformation whatsoever in our country. If we uh, try to see what Portuguese retain, what is it that uh, Europeans that follow the uh, policies of governments of the member states, what is it that they retain as transformation that has been executed by the government of the Socialist Party? In a TV program, somebody said uh, about something else, please tell me one, please tell me one, just one structural transformation, one structural change that the socialist government has uh, done uh, uh, or has promoted in the life of our country. And we need to uh, denounce uh, these uh, in our political struggle and we need to share this with our uh, partners in the EU. And the use of European funding should be even more important for Port Portugal. Should we have these transformations, we would uh, have more public investment, more uh, funding channeled to public investment, because the country would be uh, would have a, a faster pace of development, uh, but this ha was not so. To add to all this, we have other aspects regarding the use of uh, EU financing. It is true that uh, you know funding has been centralized. The management of these funders um, of these funds has been centralized. There has been. Uh, uh, a tremendous bureaucratic uh, process and we need to see what uh, will emerge during the next years. As a result of this, what is it that the Portuguese government is doing right now? I feel very much at ease and this is especially for our um, guests. I've been the uh, president of uh, PSD for the last uh, six months and I leave one uh, week per month in each region of the country, literally. And I've visited all the municipalities, I've uh, uh, been in all the municipalities of the country, and I've been listening to people. I've uh, been discussing together with the populations. We are a party of people. I've been listening to institutions, to local powers. Everything that the government, the Portuguese government, has not done uh, in the scope of the design of the RF, he has not heard people or uh, municipalities. As mentioned here before, I've started to do this five months ago, and this week the Portuguese government started a similar program, and it copied uh, our um, actions. I mean, now they dedicate two days every month to visit the different uh, uh, municipalities. Some differences in the case of the um, government, uh, one member of the government actually visits uh, one municipalities, so do they do it faster. Uh, but we've seen now what the government of Portugal wants to do uh, by imitating us. And, uh, of course, you know, um, the imitating something is always worse than the original. What the government uh, is doing with the money of Portuguese taxpayers and with the uh, funding that we get from Burium is conducting a political campaign. These visits are being used to uh, let the Portuguese government promise that they will do work or works, public works, uh, they actually inaugurate uh, certain works. Uh, we in fact, they, they, they actually have uh, plagues of works that they would like to do, but they have been there for 15 or more years. Uh, 
and they have never actually started the work. So they are not listening to people. They are not asking for uh, people involvement. They are conducting a political pen campaign with our money. And they are doing even worse. They are traveling, you know, they, they are visiting municipalities, the projects that they have that are uh, that they can actually um, uh, fit into uh, the RRF so that we do not lose the funding. They are doing that with cost estimates that sometimes are far beyond the real costs of the work and they uh, will obviously uh, want to uh, get these projects, include them in the RRF, uh, the budget is 100, uh, uh, in the end it will cost 200 and the uh, remaining 100 will be paid by you, municipalities. So the uh, government is using uh, this opportunity to actually uh, conducting a political campaign and to um, overload the uh, Portuguese municipalities. And this, my dear friends, is something that we need to denounce. We need to debate this. And the government needs to change. The government needs to change uh, their policies because otherwise the, pol the government has, the Portuguese people uh, need to change government. And when we've started our office, uh, we wanted and we still want to have, you know, this perspective that in a mature democracy where the government has a majority in the parliament, the mandate is uh, to, uh, has to be taken until the end. Uh, now we uh, want to contribute to the reinforcement of the position of the uh, EPP. We will have um, elections uh, uh, in our country and also all over Europe, uh, as was said by Isabella Hughes uh, regarding the community of Madrid uh, and also for the central government in Spain. And I would like to tell you that our uh, calendar uh, takes will take us to September, October uh, 2026, and it, it is changed you know that uh, there is only one responsibility and that responsibility lies in the uh, socialist government. And uh, um, I would like to conclude by saying the following. We have some situations that uh, we are not really happy with here in Portugal, and this uh, has to do with uh, using uh, European funding. It is a national uh, challenge, a challenge for us politicians and uh, for people that work in different uh, stakeholders. In Portugal, we have an impact of the repercussion of European funding in the growth potential of our uh, product that is below those countries that face similar difficulties such as Greece, Croatia uh, and now uh, Romania. It is in evidence and we are the country of the EU that has the highest dependency on European funders funding for investment. We are not proud of this. It may be a motive for uh, satisfaction among socialists, but we in the Social Democratic Party, we are not like that. We want, first of all, to have funding from the EU uh, uh, being used to create value, to create a better economy. We want to be at the top of Europe 
with regards to uh, the money that we allocate to investment, to education, to resilience, and uh, the sustainability of uh, economic growth uh, uh, circles that can actually uh, impact in a more positive way the growth of our economy and the creation of wealth. And we also want to, uh, we, we don't want to continue to be dependent from uh, um, grants we receive from Europe. My dream for Portugal is uh, to be a net contributor to Europe. That is our destiny. It's not to be at the tail of Europe, but to be at the forefront of Europe. And we are here to guarantee to you uh, that with the policies of our political family, those that are concerned with the life of uh, um, families, uh, economic agents, those that actually generate uh, wealth, that uh, those that use their capital and their effort, we want to say that Portugal has everything to be a country that does things uh, as well or even better than others. We want to overtake you. Uh, that is our objective. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Now we have a lunch. Muito obrigado a todos. Temos agora um almoço aqui no hotel.